On January 4, 1996, 22-year-old Christopher Hervey sustained fatal injuries while defending himself during a botched robbery. His live-in girlfriend, 22-year-old Jade Benning, was the only eyewitness and the only one who made the call reporting the crime. Over two decades later, an anonymous thing reignited interest in the case and named a possible suspect that no one could have expected. And what really led investigators to this new suspect? What was that anonymous thing? Once again, we return to California, this time to Santa Ana. It's the county seat of Orange County and the second most populous city in the county. Blessed with excellent weather, Santa Ana is a place made for people who enjoy the outdoors. With several museums and the Santa Ana Zoo, it's a cultural feast for tourists from around the world and considered an economic and cultural hub of Orange County. Fun fact, actress Michelle Pfeiffer and Diane Keaton both hail from sunny Santa Ana. Back in 1996, though, Santa Ana was the setting for what one could call a Hollywood crime mystery. At 3 a.m. on Thursday, January 4, 1996, officers from the Santa Ana Police Department responded to a 911 call. When they arrived at the apartment complex on the 2200 block of North Broadway Street, they were met with a gruesome sight. On the living room floor lay a young man, struggling to breathe as blood pooled around his body. In the apartment, a young woman stood in a state of shock and seemed to be injured as well. The man was identified as 22-year-old Christopher Hervey, the woman as his live-in girlfriend, 22-year-old Jade Benning. His body was transported to the local mortuary for an autopsy. The only eyewitness to the crime was Jade. After recovering from the shock, police took her in for questioning to the police station. She told investigators that she and Christopher had been sleeping in the living room because they were renovating the apartment. When she woke up around 3 a.m., she saw Christopher struggling with an unknown black male. She then tried to intervene, but the attacker slashed her across her right hand. Detectives took notice of this wound on her right hand. By then, Christopher had already collapsed to the floor and the intruder had fled through the back door. She then called 911 to report the incident and ask for assistance. Jade was further interrogated by police, but her general statements were eventually cleared and she was released without charges and not considered a suspect. Investigators launched an immediate investigation into the incident. After questioning several neighbors, they discovered information that corroborated Jade's statement. Neighbors reported hearing a loud argument coming from the apartment 15 minutes before police arrived. Another neighbor claimed to have seen a man running from the scene. It was too dark to make out any features, but his gait was that of a man, the neighbor confirmed. A search of the apartment did not yield many results. The apartment was in a state of disarray, but there was no murder weapon found inside or anywhere in the vicinity of the apartment complex. Crime scene technicians worked to recover any possible traces of DNA or fingerprints. They also bagged items that might be used as evidence from the apartment of Christopher and Jade. In the days that followed, an autopsy was performed on Christopher. It revealed that he'd been stabbed multiple times in the upper chest. Several major arteries had been punctured, leading to him bleeding out to death. His body was swabbed and fingernail clippings were taken for DNA testing. His body was released to his family, and he was buried in a private ceremony at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in mid-January 1996. Christopher's family thereafter remained private and avoided interviews with the media. Investigators began to hit dead ends from the beginning of the investigation. The fingerprints found at the crime scene all checked out. There were no matches to DNA on any criminal database, and there was no trace of a murder weapon. Interviews with people closest to Christopher and Jade provided no clues either. They had no known enemies and did not seem to have trouble in their relationship. The days turned to weeks, and despite police reports circulating in the area, no new leads came through. Investigators concluded that Christopher's murder was the result of a botched robbery. Soon after the murder of Christopher, Jade went back to living with her family. Jade had moved around quite a bit in the California area, living in many places including Arletta, Huntington Beach, Santa Ana, and Anaheim. She eventually relocated to Las Vegas, Nevada in 2001. After some time, she moved to Austin, Texas and permanently settled in the city. Jade too lived under the radar of the media, and there's almost little to no information about her life since the death of Christopher. It's unclear she ever married, but there are reports that she had three children. She also owned her own vintage clothing company. For Jade and the family and friends of Christopher Hervey, the case seemed to go so cold that it was frozen in time. No new evidence in two decades meant no progress in the situation, and their lives remained stagnant while awaiting answers. 
The dust had long ago settled on the case, and all possibility of discovering who killed Christopher Hervey seemed lost, until another twist in the case revealed itself. In January 2020, 24 years after the murder of Christopher, Santa Ana police received an unusual tip. An anonymous letter arrived at the police station and revealed details previously unknown to the police. Investigators have not yet released the details of the letter, nor have they identified who wrote and posted it. They have, however, said that the letter revealed information that had been withheld previously, and in doing so, implicated a potential suspect. Cold Case Detective Michael Gibbons of the Homicide Division at the Santa Ana Police Department took over the case in January 2020 and began re-examining the evidence. Together with his team, Gibbons went through the details of the crime in the witness statement. They also reviewed the statements given by neighbors and the DNA evidence discovered at the scene. Exact details of the investigation remain unknown. However, officers from the Santa Ana Police Department said that it included a review of the forensic evidence. There was also a circumstantial angle that was covered, but details remain scarce. On June 11, 2020, a search warrant was issued for a person of interest related to the case. Investigators did not immediately reveal the identity of the person, but said that their search led them to Austin, Texas. Items of interest were seized and used as possible evidence. Over the next two years, investigators from the Santa Ana Police Department, the Austin Police Department, and the U.S. Marshals Lone Star Fugitive Task Force performed surveillance on the suspect. In that time, they were able to find sufficient evidence that helped them obtain a criminal complaint arrest warrant for their suspect. When investigators did eventually close in on the suspect, it came as a shock to all involved in the case. The suspect was none other than Jade Benning. Cold case out of California, 26 years after her boyfriend was found stabbed to death. 48-year-old Jade Benning has been arrested in connection. At 2.20 p.m. on Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022, Jade Benning, now aged 48, was arrested at a traffic stop near her home in Austin, Texas by U.S. Marshals. Jade had been returning home after fetching her youngest son from school that afternoon. She was led through a parking garage in handcuffs by arresting officers. According to reports, her movements had been closely monitored over the past two years. While Jade confirmed nothing to investigators, detectives have theorized that Jade and Christopher may have gotten into an argument that escalated to violence. Jade in turn may have stabbed Christopher and got rid of the murder weapon before calling 911. She then created the story of an unknown attacker who entered their apartment with the intention to rob them. This theory is also supported by the neighbor's statements that there had been a loud argument prior to police arriving at the crime scene. After her arrest, Jade was detained at the Travis County Jail and kept with her bail set at $1 million. In May 2022, she was extradited to California for her hearing. Jade made her first court appearance on Monday, May 23, 2022. Her arraignment was rescheduled for June 8, 2022. At the hearing, she pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. Jade has since been detained on a $1.1 million bond at the Orange County Jail. As the case is still unfolding, details remain limited. There's not been any new information regarding the evidence that was discovered. No reports have yet been made with regard to when Jade Benning's trial is set to begin. For the moment, Jade's children remain in the custody of her mother at their home in Austin, Texas. The family of Christopher Hervey have not released a statement regarding the arrest of Jade Benning. Today's case is indeed a strange one. It raises questions as to what investigators have discovered now that they didn't find out in 1996, and what exactly was in that anonymous letter. So our question to you is, do you think Jade Benning is guilty as charged? Okay, tell me exactly what happened there. Somebody has entered my house when I was away and they shot my father. He is dead. I am staying outside. I contacted my mother first. She did not pick up the phone. She left a voicemail, but she is on her way back at some point this evening. Okay. I want her to know about this too, but... Uh, but I'm outside. Okay. Okay. And you don't know who did this? I don't know who did this, ma'am. It was a Saturday afternoon on September 29th, 2018, when 24-year-old Daniel Attaway walked into his home in the 500 block of Hardage Farm Drive in Marietta, Georgia, and found his father, 59-year-old Wayne Attaway, on the floor, lifeless. Frantically, he called 911 and told the operator about the nightmarish tragedy that had just occurred. 
Wayne, a peaceful man, had fallen prey to a vicious attack in broad daylight in his quiet neighborhood. The incident shocked the whole town, but no one could have imagined what actually happened to Wayne. As the morbid details of that fateful September day unfolded, Wayne's family found themselves in a very dark place. Who could have killed Wayne? What could someone have against such a simple man? Marietta is a city in the county seat of Cobb County, Georgia, United States. It's best known for its friendly sense of community and the top-tier education it offers its residents. With a lot of green space, easy access to everyday amenities, and a variety of unique shopping and dining options, many consider Marietta to be one of the best places to live in. But Marietta does have a darker side. Marietta has much higher rates of violent crime than the majority of other U.S. cities, making it a place where residents must be vigilant to protect themselves. And what happened with Wayne Attaway in 2018 still haunts the people of the city. Douglas Wayne Attaway was born to the couple Clara and George Walden Attaway on November 7, 1958, in Box Springs, Talbot County, Georgia. From the day he was born, everyone simply called him Wayne. Wayne was the third of four siblings. He was preceded by sisters Beverly and Nancy, and followed by Sylvia, the youngest one of the family. Wayne and his sisters grew up together and developed a close bond with each other, which turned him into a loving brother. During the 1970s, in his school years, Wayne played football for Pacelli Vikings Catholic High School in Columbus, Georgia. Wayne graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 1981 with a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management. He then began work at Milliken in LaGrange, Georgia. By the next year, Wayne had already met the love of his life, Carolyn Wojtyziak. Wayne and Carolyn got married on September 18, 1982. In 1988, Wayne and Carolyn moved to Atlanta when Wayne secured a position with Frito-Lay and moved to Marietta when he began his building career with PJ Row Construction. The couple went on to have a healthy and romantic married life and had a daughter on June 5, 1989. They named her Morgan. Around this time, Wayne was already planning to switch jobs and wanted to start his own company. Although it did take a while, on March 25, 1992, Wayne, along with his friends Scott Maness and Loris Willard, formed the partnership of Willard Atman Construction Incorporation, a commercial general contractor. At their new company, Loris was the president and Wayne the vice president, while Scott was given the position of vice president and secretary. When Wayne was doing well at his new workplace, he and Carolyn thought it was time to expand their family. And on April 24, 1994, Wayne and Carolyn welcomed their second child, a son, and named him Daniel. Even though Wayne had a tight work schedule, he always made time for his children and performed all his duties well. Wayne received a Catholic baptism in 1995 at St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Marietta, Georgia. Even though Wayne's new business with Loris and Scott began on Wiley Road in Marietta, it was moved to White Circle in Marietta on March 29, 2000, as the business outgrew its first office. Wayne excelled at his work and contributed efficiently towards his company's success in the many years he worked there. By 2018, when Daniel and Morgan were adults, Wayne had more time for himself and had developed a liking towards quite a few hobbies. He specifically enjoyed cowboy shooting, carpentry, motorcycle riding, horseback riding, hiking, and both water and snow skiing. Sitting down with a good book and a cold beer was one of Wayne's favorite things to do. As a man in his late 50s, Wayne was living a peaceful life in 2018 with his family in his 570 Hard Age Farm Drive home off Burnt Hickory Road in Marietta. But that very same year, all of that was taken away from Wayne. On Saturday, September 29, 2018, when Wayne's family was not home and he was all alone in the house, a tragedy struck. Around 4.30 p.m., 24-year-old Daniel, Wayne's son, returned home and walked into his house. What he discovered inside was something he could never have been prepared for. Daniel found his father, 59-year-old Wayne, lying on the floor covered in blood. Wayne wasn't moving at all. Panic-stricken, Daniel immediately rushed out of the house and told his neighbors what had happened. Daniel then borrowed a phone from them and called his mother, Carolyn. But when she didn't answer, Daniel dialed 911 and informed the operator of the horrific scene that was in front of his eyes. Cobb County 911, what's the location of your emergency? 911, this is Hardage Farm Drive. Okay, what road does that run off of? What road? Yes, what cross street? What is it's off Burnt Hickory. Okay, can I get your name and your phone number in case we get disconnected? Yes, 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 yes. yes. My name is Daniel Adway, last name A-T-T-A-W-A-Y. 
Okay, tell me exactly what happened there. Somebody has entered my house when I was away and they shot my father. He is dead. Okay. Okay, are you still inside the house? No, I'm here now and I don't know... Are you in the house? ...where anybody is. I'm outside the house right now. I'm in the backyard. Okay, and you don't know who did this? I don't know who did this, ma'am. Okay, I want you to stay outside, okay? Are you in your vehicle or can you get in your vehicle? No, I am I'm staying outside. I contacted my mother first. She did not pick up the phone. She left the voicemail, but she is on her way back at some point this evening. Okay. I want her to know about this too, but... Uh, but I'm outside. Okay. As heard on the call, Daniel told the operator that he'd just entered his home and found that his father had been shot and appeared to be dead. He believed that someone had broken into the house and shot his father. After listening to Daniel describe the scene frantically and in a shaking voice, the 911 operator seemed concerned, and here's how she responded. All right, I'm going to stay on the phone with you until, until responders arrive, okay? But they are on the way to you, lights and sirens already, okay? Appreciate that, ma'am. Okay, you. you're welcome. What vehicle? Do you have your vehicle in the front yard or in the driveway? My vehicle and his are at the house. Okay. Both are under his name, however. Okay, that's okay. Okay, and you said you didn't see who did this at all? No, ma'am. Okay. Are you still there, ma'am? Yes, sir, I'm still here. I'm still here on the phone with you. Officers from the Marietta Police Department were dispatched to 570 Hard H Farm Drive at 4.31 p.m. that afternoon. After hanging up, Daniel met with the officers and led them inside the house into the basement where Wayne's body was lying. They identified and confirmed the victim as 59-year-old Douglas Wayne Attaway. The detectives described the scene as gruesome and noted that Wayne had been shot twice, once in his upper right shoulder and once in the head, right in the middle of his eyes, close to the forehead. The detectives didn't waste even a second and got to work. They started questioning the neighbors and Wayne's family members to find out if anyone had seen anything or if there were any witnesses to the morbid incident. But sadly, no one had seen anything suspicious around Wayne's home. As Daniel had already told his neighbors about Wayne's death, and since police vehicles were already crowding the streets, the news of the terrible incident started to blow up. People in the Hard H Farm Drive neighborhood grew worried as they rarely saw any police officers in the area. Officer Chuck McPhillamy, who was assigned to work on the case, assured the residents of the Hard H Farm Drive neighborhood that Wayne's murder was an isolated incident and there was no reason for them to be concerned. For the next two days, detectives combed the scene and canvassed the neighborhood looking for clues and keeping an eye out for any potential suspects. The detectives interviewed Wayne's family members separately to know if they had any suspicion of anyone or if Wayne was on bad terms with someone but no names came up in those questioning rounds. However, during a search of the Attaway home, the detectives found out that the Sig Sauer Model P250, a handgun, was missing from the family's weapon collection. According to the neighbors, Wayne's merciless murder had rocked the quiet and affluent Hard Age Farm community. They told the detectives that Wayne was a longtime resident of Marietta and hence was well known by them. They also stated that Wayne was a calm person and was liked by all. They didn't think he had any enemies and believed that Wayne was shot by an unknown intruder. Detectives then searched through Wayne's neighbor's surveillance systems for any clues and asked them to report any information regarding the case to Marietta police investigators. Even though the detectives were progressing well in their investigation, there was a piece of information from Wayne's family that completely broke open the case. A few days after Wayne's murder, the killer himself confessed to Wayne's family. The confession came from Daniel himself. Daniel told his mother, Carolyn, that he and Wayne were not in a good spot with each other and they'd been arguing a lot lately. Daniel reached his breaking point when Wayne gave him an ultimatum and the tension between the two peaked. Daniel loved to paint and spent most of his time indulging in that same activity, posting pictures of his artwork on his social media platforms quite a lot. He'd recently developed a liking for welding and was thinking of practicing more of it to develop better skills. But one day, Wayne told Daniel to either get a job or move out of his house. This angered Daniel, and his rage got the best of him. 
That afternoon, on September 29, 2018, when Carolyn and Morgan weren't home, Daniel took a handgun from the family's weapon collection and shot his father, first in the shoulder, then in the head between the eyes. Wayne fell to the ground, taking his last breath. After performing the sinful act, Daniel planned a whole facade. He called 911 and told the operator a story of lies where he'd come off as an innocent person. He told the officers at the crime scene the same story, hinting that the murder was the job of an outsider who'd broken into the house. Both Carolyn and her daughter Morgan were in complete shock. Daniel's confession turned their already sorrowful lives into something that was completely grim. Daniel also told them that he was ashamed and had realized what he'd done was heinous. Eventually, being apologetic, Daniel decided to turn himself into the authorities. While Daniel's confession itself was solid proof linking him to his father's murder, the detectives had come up with some strong evidence as well. Detectives found that Wayne had been shot with a 9mm handgun, and they found a gun with a matching description in the woods near a creek bed about 100 yards from the family's home. The murder weapon was identified as a Sig Sauer Model P250, which was the same firearm that was missing from the Attaway family's gun collection when the investigators initially searched the home. The gun had been purchased by Wayne himself, but Daniel's name was also on the receipt. The detectives also made Daniel go through a gunshot residue test, which came back positive and confirmed traces of the residue on Daniel's clothes. A son is accused of shooting his father execution style, and he is now charged with murder in Marietta. Police say 24-year-old Dan Daniel Attaway killed his father Douglas in the basement of his home over the weekend. The police report details Attaway calling 911, but claiming that he found his father's body after he got home. By Monday, October 1st, 2018, investigators have developed sufficient evidence to tie Daniel to Wayne's killing. On Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018, Daniel Walden Attaway, son of the deceased Wayne Attaway, was charged and arrested from 290 Lemon Street in Marietta, Georgia. He was charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault with intent to commit murder, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Daniel was being held without a bond at the Cobb County Adult Detention Center awaiting his trial. Wayne's death took a toll on Carolyn. She was devastated. She remembered that only a couple of weeks ago, on September 18th, 2018, she and Wayne had celebrated their 36th wedding anniversary. She'd never imagined that one day, her own son would destroy her once happy family. With a heavy heart and the pain of finding out the reality behind Wayne's murder, Carolyn and Morgan received Wayne's friends and family for a prayer service at May's Ward Dobbins Funeral Home on Friday, October 5th, 2018. People gathered to remember and celebrate the time Wayne had spent with them. At 12 noon on Saturday, October 6, 2018, a funeral service for Wayne was held at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Marietta. Wayne was laid to rest at Kennesaw Memorial Park, Marietta, Cobb County, Georgia. Daniel Attaway had entered a not guilty plea and retained the service of Marietta criminal defense attorney Mazzy Maslum. Even though Mazzy hadn't spent a lot of time with Daniel yet, he said that Daniel seemed like a decent kid. When asked about the case, Mazzy said it was too early to comment on the details of the case, but he said that not guilty pleas were typical in cases such as this. On Tuesday, October 9th, 2018, Mazzy Maslum, Daniel's attorney, announced that an initial hearing for Daniel Walden Attaway was scheduled for November 29th, 2018. Mazzy said that his main focus of the hearing would be to try to get more evidence than what was already on the arrest warrant. A few hearings for Daniel's case took place in the following days, but due to Daniel's non-compliant behavior, a verdict was still far from being reached. During his time in the prison and throughout his hearings over the years, Daniel's behavior turned unnatural and in the lead up to a trial scheduled in 2021, Daniel was declared mentally incompetent. That same year, Daniel was moved from the Cobb County Jail to a Decatur hospital. There, Daniel was made to undergo a psychological evaluation. The results of the state's most recent evaluation were submitted to the court on April 12, 2021, but those reports remained sealed and the details were never released to the public. Then later in the same month, Daniel was deemed fit to stand trial by the state psychologists. From the state doctor's perspective, they didn't believe that criminal responsibility was an issue for Daniel. They thought that he was legally sane and now fit to go ahead with the trial. Mazzy, Daniel's attorney, said that he'd have a private expert review the state's findings. He stated that since competency was always fluid, Daniel could go on with his trial if he kept up with his medication and didn't have any bad reactions. Another year without a verdict passed, and by 2022, 
Daniel had already been in the lockup at the Cobb County Adult Detention Center for the past three and a half years. On Wednesday, March 16, 2022, Daniel Walden Adway pleaded guilty but mentally ill to one count of malice murder for killing his 59-year-old father, Douglas Wayne Attaway, back in September 2018. Daniel was 27 years old at the time he was sentenced. The sentence and admission of guilt were part of a negotiated plea deal that brought an end to a case that had lasted more than three years. Supreme Court Judge Kim Childs sentenced Daniel Attaway to 50 years, out of which Daniel would spend 25 years behind bars, followed by 25 years of probation. As part of his plea agreement, Daniel's 50-year sentence included the requirement of mental health supervision for the whole duration of his time in custody and probation. The verdict on Daniel's sentencing was made public on Friday, March 18, 2022, when Cobb County District Attorney Flynn Brody Jr. announced it in a news release that same day. Wayne's family, Carolyn and Morgan, didn't make any comments about the verdict. The mother and daughter were already in the process of healing, and to go back to anything that would remind them of the tragedy could bring back old wounds. They were only trying to put the whole incident behind them and move on with their lives with the hopes of a better future. Wayne's case was an extremely depressing one. Just because of Daniel's irrational actions, a family's whole course of life was altered. Carolyn has now accepted reality and lives each day trying to make it better than the last. On her social media platforms, she keeps sharing her most cherished memories of Wayne with her loved ones. Even though Daniel entered a guilty but mentally ill plea, do you think there was any truth in that? Or do you think he was only faking it to get a reduced sentence? Do you think that Carolyn and Morgan had any idea that Daniel, their youngest family member, was capable of something so evil? Stop calling me Isabella. See, Don't call you're... me Isabella. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not Isabella. Uh -oh. I am Samantha Gonzalez. Did you find any parallels between Samantha and the girl depicted in the initial clip? No? Let's find out. August 28th, 2013, a teenage girl entered in a Korean grocery store called H Mart. She was dirty, covered in cuts, and her hair was tangled with twigs and blood. The girl, Samantha Gonzalez, age 15, revealed that she had narrowly escaped an assault and stabbing in downtown Denver. In 2013, Aurora was the third most populous city in Colorado. But in this busy place filled with civilians lived a small family that had been facing some problems at the time. The relations between a teenage daughter and her mother are seldom calm, and such was the case with Yun Mi Hoi and her daughter, Isabella Guzman. Isabella Guzman was born on June 1, 1995, in Aurora, Colorado. She grew up in a Mormon household with her parents, Yun Mi Hoi and Robert Guzman. Isabella was the only child. Yun Mi ran a photography studio called Bella's Photos, obviously named after her daughter, and worked long hours. When Isabella was four years old, her parents got divorced, and her mother later got remarried to Ryan Hoy. At seven, when Isabella started displaying behavioral issues, her mother sent her to live with her father. She lived with him for seven years before returning to her mother and stepfather's house at the age of 14. Yeah, they got divorced like 14 years ago. Okay, how old was Isabella? Isabella was, was she was about uh, three years old. Three years old, okay. Were, were you and you and me involved at that point with each After other? After they divorced, um, you, me, and I were involved okay. with each other. So was Isabella living with you guys initially? She was living with us initially. Okay, then it got to be difficult. Then it got to be difficult because uh, when she was about five years old, um, you, me, asked Bobby, Robert, to take over Isabella because she was just not a very obedient child. Okay. And thought that uh, Robert, her natural father, would be a better, would be better for her. Okay. as a disciplinarian. And how old was uh, Isabel at the time? She was about uh, five, and um, she had difficulties in that family. She didn't get along with her stepmom at all. Okay, so at one point, when this all happens, and Isabel is now living with, with her not, mother, she's living with yeah. her father and his wife? Right. 
Okay, how long a period was that from the time she was five till? She moved back into our house. Well, I'm trying to think now. It might have been seven. She might have been seven when that when that occurred, because it seems like she was out of our house for maybe six or seven years. Okay. So she was um, she was about 14 when she came back to live with us. Despite returning to live with her mom and stepfather later, Isabella continued to struggle during her teenage years. And then we noticed a pattern developing with Isabella. She got in trouble for uh, shoplifting from King Supers. And then she got uh, in trouble for shoplifting from the Aurora Mall. Then she did a couple of trespassing, um, some underage drinking at school. Mm -hmm. She brought a knife to school one day. She had brought it to school and she was expelled from school for bringing a weapon. How long ago was this? school? That was maybe three years ago. This animosity that Isabella had towards your wife when she was asked to leave or had to live with her father, right. when she moved back in at 14, right. how, was, how was the relationship between the two of them after that? Very rocky okay. at best. Had they ever gotten in any, any physical confrontations, not, fights that you know of? Not physical, but verbal. Verbal? You and me would go, you're an effing B, B, B you know, an effing B. Okay. Go away. Okay. Leave me alone. She would say these things all day. And here recently. That was you and me was telling that was, Isabella that? Or Isabella? No, that was Isabella telling you and me that. Okay. And you and me would be like, no, you go away. You know, you and me would strike back at her and say, you know, don't treat your mother like that. You don't say those things to your mother. Okay. Did you ever get involved in this in, in, in intervention or intervening at all in these? There was a, there was occasions when I did, but I realized the best course of action was to not get involved because um, Isabella and I really had no problems with each other because I just kind of stayed out of it. Okay. I just let her and her mom deal with it. Being the stepdad, you know, it's easy to be the one the girl would hate. Right. But um, I just stayed out of a lot of it. I wanted to say something, but I just let my wife handle it. Okay. She sometimes had problems with her stepdad, too. I was down in the basement with my fan on, and she came down to grab my fan, and she took it out of the wall, and I said, Isabella, please, you know, you can't do that. And so she punched me a couple of times in the face. She said something in Spanish, and... Uh, and then punch me. She is um, very hot-tempered. Hot-tempered, okay. Very hot-tempered person. It doesn't, uh, and she runs her mouth like crazy. F you, F this, F that. Um, she seems very depressed, I would okay. have to say. She seems horribly depressed okay. about her life and blames her mom for her misery. She went to a psychiatrist for maybe a month, and the psychiatrist said, um, no, she's fine, she's just a typical girl. At the age of 14, she decided to leave the Mormon religion, causing tension within the family. Her behavioral issues extended to school, where she got into fights with her classmates and eventually dropped out during her senior year. As a teenager, Isabella was seen by neighbors sneaking boys into her home. As time passed by and Isabella turned 18, the relationship between Isabella and her mother started to deteriorate rapidly. She became aggressive and threatening towards her mother, who was scared and exhausted trying to cope with her behavior. On August 27, 2013, a particularly heated argument occurred between Isabella and her mother, during which Isabella spat on her and cursed her. But there was one strange thing about this incident. During this, Isabella called her mother Cecilia. So I was sleeping in in her room, which is the upstairs bedroom that faces the street. Okay. And that's where I slept last night. Okay. She was, af she was afraid she, she'd come down to the basement. I don't want to go too fast. But she came down to the basement last night and said that she was afraid of Isabella. She said that Isabella had threatened her or cursed at her, maybe cursed at her, and spit in her face. Okay. And she was laying down up there. The next day, Yun received an email from Isabella with the unsettling message, You will pay. It was still addressed to Cecilia, causing Yun to become even more frightened. 
this morning she showed me an email that Isabella had written that was written to her or written to a Cecilia. So strange email, but it came to my wife. It's, it came to my wife. It, I can't remember what the email said. It's on her phone. Okay. But it was very disturbing from Isabella. Something very just weird. She then called the police for help. Hello, and I'm a one where is your emergency? Uh, yes. Uh, my daughter need a help. Do you need police? Eight, can you hear or, or, or an ambulance? Nah, I think she has to be admitted because she hurt herself or she hurt somebody else in the house. Okay, so she's suicidal she's and she wants to hurt herself? She's not suicidal, but she was planning, planning. She can be suicidal, or she can hurt me or somebody else in the house. So did she? Did she threaten to hurt you, or you're worried she might hurt you? She threatened to hurt me last night. Okay. Two in the morning, and I think she snapped. Her so, mind is gone. I think. So did she do anything to herself or you yet? I don't know about that because she locked herself in the room and she came out and now she's in the backyard talking to her father. Okay, so she's, to in the, down. she's in the backyard so she's not bleeding or doesn't need like a emergency as far as uh, medical goes? No, not the medical. It's, in, it's, in, um, it's a psychological problem. So does she have any weapons on her right now? She has a bat. And no, not with her in her room. And what is, what's I, your um, name? I hate to do it. I'm sorry. What's your name? My name? Yes. My name is Yunmi Y-U-N-M-I. I'm her mother. Okay. Yunmi Hoi, H-O-I. Okay, what's your okay. And I'm afraid tonight she's going to hurt herself or hurt me. Okay. She's she losing and she's stabbing and she's saying non nonsense. Okay, did she, did she say how she's going to hurt herself? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, has she ever tried to hurt herself before or say she wanted to do this before? She said many times she wanted to kill herself. Okay. But she's never attempted it yet, right? I don't know. She might try, but she never say about it to me. Okay. Uni, I'm gonna go ahead and now, now she's trying, I'm, I'm afraid of my life now. Right. Well, I'm gonna let you go, but if anything changes, I want you to call call me back, okay? So what are you gonna do? We're gonna send an officer out to talk to her, and then the officer can request an ambulance, okay? And then what happened? They'll transfer her to, uh, like, a psychiatric hospital. Okay. And they'll help her out there, okay? I don't want you to get upset. I mean, you're doing the right thing, okay? I don't want you to, to regret anything later. I mean, if something bad were to happen, you'd regret that worse, okay? Yeah, I think I'm, I think this is cool for her in time. The police arrived and informed Isabella that she was an adult and could be kicked out of the house if her behavior continued. But when the police asked her if she wanted to end her own life, she chuckled and asked why someone as beautiful as her would want that. Isabella seemed to calm down after speaking with the police. So today, after the police come out and speak with her, what was her attitude or her demeanor after that contact with the, with the officers? Um, she seemed okay. She was friendly. Her dad gave her a big hug and told her that he loved her very much and gave her a kiss on the cheek. And she said, I, I think she said, I love you too. This was in the house when they had come back in the house before he was leaving the house. Okay. And, um, but I don't think she was very happy that her mom called the police. Did her and her mom have words, confrontation? Was there anything? In front of the police officers, you mean, said they, that they did. Okay, were you out love, there when that happened? I was not out there when that happened. I tried to stay out of it. Okay. And uh, Yumi said that, uh, Isabella was throwing nonsense at her, and the police were saying, "Look, you, we're going to get a, you can get a court order and have her kicked out, whether she's got a job or not." Okay. And Isabella, according to Yumi, just got all tight-lipped. But Yunmi remained uneasy. She reached out to Isabella's biological father, Robert, and asked him to talk to Isabella. Robert had an intimate conversation with his daughter, 
and it appeared that Isabella had calmed down and understood the consequences of her actions. However, this optimism was short-lived, as events would prove otherwise. On August 28, 2013, Isabella's mother, 47-year-old Yun, returned home from work at around 9.30 p.m. She was exhausted and told her husband Ryan that she needed to take a shower. Your wife comes home about 9.30, she has right. McDonald's for you, Right. and then what's the next thing that happens? And then she tells me, um, I'm going to take a shower. Okay. Did you eat? I was eating while she was upstairs. Okay. Getting ready to take so a shower. So you're in the, what part of the house then? I'm in the living room. Living room? And I'm just on the couch okay. watching TV. Okay. And your wife goes upstairs? She goes upstairs to take a shower, yeah. While Ryan was downstairs eating dinner, he heard strange noises and a scream coming from upstairs. Concerned, he rushed to find Yun and discovered Isabella had locked herself and Yun Mi in the bathroom. Isabella was in the bathroom. She, like I said, she was pushing against the door as I was trying to open it. So the bathroom door is closed? It's closed. Okay. And... Is the shower running or not? Shower was running. Yeah, the shower was running. Okay. So when you go up there, you hear knocking? Describe and like... Just like, something like that. Just like that, kind of a drum pounding. Okay. Doors closed. Right. Do you hear anything, any voices, any conversations? I hear my talking? wife say, Ryan. She said that a couple of times. So you hear your wife say, Ryan. And, okay. um... Any other voice? Do you hear Isabella or anybody I else? I don't say hear anything? Isabella say anything. Try to open the door. Is she the door locked or no? No, at first it wasn't locked. Okay. I, tr I, I tried to open it. Okay. And Isabella was pushing hard against it. Could you see Isabella at that point? I saw the back of her. How far open were you able to get the door? Not that far. Okay, at that point, what could you see inside? Nothing. All I saw was Isabella's frame. Okay. And she was had her back to the door? Yeah, she had her back to the door. And then the next thing I know, when I don't get the door open, the door closes and locks. As he pushed, he saw blood seeping from under the door, prompting him to call 911. Where's your emergency room? Oh, what can I help you? Uh, yes, um, my uh, stepdaughter, 18-year-old stepdaughter, is beating my wife up. Oh, okay. And it's a house? It's a house. Oh, and you said your daughter, your stepdaughter is 18? She's 18. Okay. And it's physical? It's physical, yes. Okay. Has anybody been drinking or doing drugs? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Any weapons involved? Um, they're in the bathroom, so I can't tell. Okay. Anybody in, um, does anybody need the paramedics? Um, that, I don't, I don't know. They're locked, okay. they're locked off in the bathroom. Okay. What are you hearing at this time? What do you hear? I hear her yelling for God to help her. Okay. Are you able to go and see if your wife is okay or no? I, the door is locked. I can't okay. get in. So you get on the phone? I get on the phone. Come back upstairs? Come back upstairs. And then what? And then I'm trying to tell the dispatcher what's going on. I'm saying, I think she's beating up my wife. Isabella was in a rage like I've never seen before. And, uh... What do you mean? Well, she... I could just hear her just pummeling my wife. I thought she was just hitting her with her fists. Okay, so that thumping sound you were Thumping hearing. sound, I thought, was you mean maybe hitting against the wall? Okay. And Isabella just pounding her with her fists. And that's when I said I noticed some blood was coming out of the door. Yeah, I'm, I'm up there right now. She's calling out to me. Okay, where's your stepdaughter at? Oh, my goodness. There's blood coming through the door. Okay. Okay, we're going to get the paramedics started, okay? okay? And then I didn't hear my wife say another word. It was totally quiet inside there. Just tell me if you're able to get the door open, okay? Okay. And you did say your front door was on the correct? You me? You me? No, I'm not able to get anything open. Are you able to call out to your daughter, your stepdaughter, see if she'll answer you? Isabella? 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 What's going on? Ask her who's bleeding. Who's, who's bleeding out the door? There's blood out the door. 
Isabella? What did she say? Nothing. She said nothing. Okay. I heard her say something when you called her name. Did she moan or yes, what did she, she do? She said, Isabella said, hold on. What did you do? Is the door open? Oh my God. What happened? I think my wife is dead. What? She... Oh my God, I got the door open. Sir, what happened? And I immediately saw my wife on the floor. Okay. All bloody everywhere. Okay. And I went for my wife to see if there was some way of bringing her back to life, resuscitating her. To me, she looked like she was dead. Check to see if your wife is breathing. Oh my God, there's so much blood. Is she breathing? You mean? If she's not no, breathing, she's dead. That we need to start she's to not where was your wife lying in the bathroom? Her head um, was toward the bathtub. Okay. And she was kind of all sprawled out. Was she lying on her back? She was on lying her, on her back. On her back? She wasn't wearing any clothing. Why she had a chain. Know? She had a chain on and there was blood around her neck. Are you still on the phone with the dispatcher? Yeah, I'm dispatcher on the phone with point? the dispatcher. Okay. And the dispatcher's... She's telling me what to do, lift her head up. Okay. So I put my hand behind my wife's head, and I lift her head up to see if that would get her to breathe. Okay. And then I pushed, I did push on her chest. Okay. Like that, about, I don't know, three or four times. Okay. But I could tell it was no use. Okay, we're going to start questions, okay? I don't think I can. Okay. I need you to try, okay? I need you to start trying compression, okay? I, oh, God. Okay, listen to me, okay? The, 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 okay. The, the officers and the paramedics are almost there, okay? Yeah, I did try. Okay, push down. She is, she I need you to dead. Okay. Isabella had already left when the authorities arrived. They found Yun Mi's lifeless body in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds and her throat slashed. Isabella had fled the scene, and a manhunt ensued, considering her armed and dangerous. Do you remember what she was wearing? She was wearing kind of like a, like a top piece, maybe kind of pink top piece, and then like short a shirt. Kind of like a shirt, but more like a bra. Okay. Kind of a sports bra type, okay. athletic gear. And what color? It's kind of pink. All right. And she had short shorts on. And okay. they might have been, um, they might have been kind of turquoise. When Yun Mi Hoi was taken to the emergency, she was pronounced dead. Isabella had repeatedly thrust a knife into her mother's body, 151 times, all across her body. Yet Ryan remained unaware of this gruesome truth. Holding his naked and bloodied wife, all he comprehended was the profound loss he'd suffered. And now Isabella had vanished without a trace leaving just a bloody palm print on the bathroom door. Isabella and her mother were no strangers to disagreements, but Yun Mi fought hard to connect with her daughter. Among Isabella's belongings, detectives discovered a note in her room. It was addressed to her dear daughter, Isabella, conveying love despite their differences. The message read, Even though we have some differences, I want you to know, I love you and will always love you. Mom. But, Yun Mi did not know that this was the last time she'd convey her love to her beloved daughter. The suspect, Isabella Guzman, 18 years old. This is the woman police are looking for. They were searching for her everywhere last night. They even used the help of a the Denver police chopper last night. They did a reverse 911 to homes within a one and a half mile radius searching for this woman. Here's what we know so far. Isabella became the prime suspect sought by the town. Images of the young woman, her attractiveness evident, were splashed across the news, leaving her friends in utter disbelief. The Aurora City Police initiated a search for Isabella. Meanwhile, they began interviewing her friends and family members. And when the police squads were searching for Isabella, a girl covered with blood, Samantha Gonzalez, had fled away after a stranger asked to help her. Around 24 hours after the murder of Yun Mi Hoi, Samantha was spotted by another stranger in a parking garage. Her legs dangled outside the jeep she was sleeping in. Actually, you were sleeping in a jeep. A jeep? Yeah, the basement of the parking garage. Do you remember that? I was not sleeping in a jeep. 
Why are you lying about just where you were sleeping? We, we, somebody saw you. How do you think we found you? Somebody saw you and called us. The stranger thought it was a dead body and immediately called the police. The officers came and learned that her name was Samantha Gonzalez and she'd claimed to be from Cincinnati. She still had a plastic bag in her hand labeled Korean H Mart and she had a knife with her. So the knife that we found is not going to have your fingerprints and your DNA on it? No, I'm not. It was evident that she was Isabella. But according to her, she'd fled her home due to a terrifying incident involving her mother and a pair of scissors. Samantha had managed to get a bus ticket and escape, ending up far away from familiar surroundings. She'd also mentioned waiting for her boyfriend, also revealing that she was just 15 years old. The police took her to the hospital because she had bruises all over her body. All that time, she kept screaming that she did not kill that lady. Isabella did. When Ryan was called to the hospital, he tried to hug Isabella or Samantha, and she pushed him away, saying that she didn't know him. But nevertheless, the police knew the truth, and she was arrested the same day and taken for interrogation. Um, I am Samantha Gonzalez. Your, you have got the your wrong actions person. today are going to have a, have a very, very big oh impact God, on the rest man. of your life. You guys keep interrogating me. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, are, what the hell is going on? Can you please just... Do you understand what I'm saying, Isabella? Do you understand what I'm saying? You're, Don't you're, call you, me Isabella. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not Isabella. Your decisions today are going to have a big impact on the rest of your life. You're 18 years old. You've got a I'm long 15. ways to go. Fingerprint me. No, you're not in charge. You're arresting we, we, me because we, I look like somebody. That's wrong. It is you. It's not me. It was as if Isabella was interrogating the detectives. She wasn't ready to accept that she was Isabella. Instead, she said she was 15 and her name was Samantha. The detectives, too, rather than calmly taking her case, were parenting her. You're acting like you're running this investigation. What do you mean? You're demanding to be fingerprinted. You're demanding to be weighed. Don't I you're have a right? telling us that you don't, you're not this person, that we've made a big mistake, we've arrested don't the Don't I have person. a right to prove that I am innocent? Yes, right? So please, can do you I understand the law? Can somebody please to fingerprint me? Do you understand the law? Uh, kind of. I've never been arrested or anything before. Where'd you go to high school? This place called um, Montgomery High School, Ohio. Montgomery? Yeah. I got kicked out, no, though. No, you didn't go there. You went to Overland. You're Overland High School. You went to Overland High School. No, I didn't. You're in the yearbook. She went to Overland High School. I did not. No, no, no. She is you. No, she is not. Okay, well... She is, but is that is this just your way of uh, of uh, dealing with this? You, you pretend you're somebody you're not. I mean, is that your mechanism for? Uh, this for... is just really frustrating. I'm not even really scared or anything at all because I know that I'm not this person. So you're not scared at all? Because I'm not her. Are you on any drugs? Uh, no. Any prescription medication? No. You ever been to a doctor for anything? I've been sick before, like every other normal person. You know, what kind of things have you had? What kind of sicknesses? Regular colds, nothing serious. You been to a psychiatrist? No. You been diagnosed with any mental problems? No. Isabella's nonchalant responses to the investigators and her staunch stance against being recognized as the killer of her mom was getting on the nerves of the detectives now. In total, Isabella had pummeled a knife into her mother's body all over her body. 151 times. But Ryan didn't know this as he clutched his naked, bloody wife. All he knew was that he had lost her. The frustration of the detectives was fairly evident. They were now reclining towards personal attacks. But things were about to take a turn as the detectives tried to play into Isabella's made-up story. I really have no idea. I would never kill my own mother. She may be a horrible person, but I don't have the potential in me to kill anyone. Why is your mother a horrible person? She hates me because I'm a legitimate child. So she hates you? Yeah, I kind of ruined her marriage, basically, and they blame me for it. So you got anger issues? I don't have anger issues. I just left. You hate your mom. That's kind I don't of an anger issue. She's scary. Just scary. So I ran away. Did your mom beat you? She doesn't beat. She hurts with weapons like scissors. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. What's that? 
Hello? Is What's that? Fun? I got that when I was a kid. I had stitches. No, that's not that's from stitches. It is from stitches. How did you get that? Lines. Police dog, wasn't it? Police dog? Mm -hmm. This fellow got bit by a police dog has a scar on her right arm. This is really freaky. Yeah, that is really freaky. Isabella's and Samantha's story were quite similar. The difference was just that Isabella stabbed her mother and killed her. And the detectives knew that. Why don't bring you just Robert bring the here. DNA test? Let's bring Robert down here. Who's Robert? You know who Robert is. No, I don't. Robert could stand right there in that doorway and identify you. You're his own flesh and blood. The detectives knew that Isabella was very close to her father and her mother's first husband, Robert Guzman. How about if we have Ryan come down? Who's that? Your stepdad. Have him That's come her in. stepdad. We could have Ryan come in. I mean, he's the one that last saw you before you took off running from the police last night. Um, this he's, is all her life, and he, he keeps saying the it's one mine. That, he's the one that identified you. What do you think about that? We'll have him come down. Maybe you can apologize. I'm not going to apologize better. to a stranger. What do you mean? I well, didn't kill come anybody. In and lie about, he would come in and stand at the doorway and lie about committing somebody who committed him. Well, obviously somebody died or this wouldn't be happening, but I didn't kill anybody. Why would he lie about it? I don't even know what you're trying to, I don't even understand what you're trying to say right now. The detectives also threatened her with the possibility of calling Ryan Hoy, Isabella's stepdad. But Isabella flatly denied knowing him. Isabella was constantly nagging about having a DNA test done on her to prove that she was not the killer. She thought that the DNA results came right away, but in actuality, it took months to come up with those results. Please bring the DNA test now so I can leave. You're not leaving, just to so understand that. The DNA will not match. Well, that... You can if the DNA to, does not match, I will be free, right? You can to think that, but you are not leaving. Just so okay, you know. theoretically, if the DNA doesn't match, you have to let me go, right? No. That doesn't make any sense. Yes. No, you've been identified as a killer. I have not been identified. Well, if the DNA does not match, then I will be set free. Well, that's not going to be the case. We won't know that for months. For You're months. under arrest for first-degree murder. You have no bond. You ain't going nowhere but jail. And you're not 15. You're 18. No, I'm not. You cannot do this to me. This is wrong. Yes, we you can. You have to prove I am who she is before you can take me anywhere. No, we don't. We Isabella, don't. we're trying to give you Stop an opportunity. Stop calling me Isabella. We're just trying to give you an opportunity to tell us what happened. Stop calling me Isabella. So you don't understand. You don't understand. My the name full is Samantha. Of this, do you? You don't understand the full impact. Yes, you're going to jail. No, you are not getting out of jail. There is no bond with first degree murder. Do you understand that? I didn't murder anybody. And we'll easily prove a case against you. You can't prove anything because I didn't do it. Yeah, we will. Well, that's your opinion. Man, what's wrong with all you? Have of you have no conscience. None. I'm not evil. You don't yeah, even know who you're... I am. I'm just a random girl on the street oh. that you ambushed. No, you're one of the most evil person I've ever sat across the table from. I'm not evil. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Very. Next, the detectives again tried to play into Isabella's story and take her DNA. You scared the hell out of me. Because you have no conscience. I scared the hell out of you? Yeah, you have no conscience. You can do anything to anybody and can not even do, feel it. How do you do this thing? Say, for instance, somehow um, we've got this all jacked up. And you are who you say you are. And we, we've brought the wrong person in here. How would we go about trying to prove that you are who you are? Who, who could we call? Who could we get in contact There's with? There's no way I'm totally... Why would I call somebody who stabbed me with scissors? Well, I'm asking you That's a question. That's all I've got. Okay, can Gabriel I ask, is waiting for me. Can I ask you a question and just have, not have you interrupt? Because if we're making a mistake, we want to we want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't we start with um, who's your father? What's your father's mm -hmm. name? I don't really know. Honestly, my mom's kind of a crazy bitch and whores around a lot. Okay. She hates me because I'm an illegitimate child. Okay, so... All I know is that my dad's Mexican. That's why my last name is Gonzalez. The detectives were doing the right thing. They were trying to trap Isabella in her own lies. They knew that there was no Gonzalez that Isabella was related to. Okay, so your dad is Mexican. His last name's Gonzalez. Do you know his first name? She wouldn't tell me. So you don't know his first name? No. Have you met your father? No. So you never met your father? I ran away. Gabriel was all I got. Okay, slow down. I want to get to the bottom of this. So... 
Gonzalez is all you know. You don't know first name. She comes with Gonzalez to prove to from? me that I'm not good enough to be her daughter or something. Where's your father from? I just know he's Mexican. But where's he from? from Mexico. He's from Remember Mexico? So he's from Mexico, the country Mexico? Oh, well, I guess, obviously. Isabella had told the officers that her mother's name was Sabrina Hicks and not Yun Mi Hoi. Now, the detectives were digging into that. What's Sabrina's birthday? I don't know. You don't know your mom's birthday? Um, I think that in this world, there's got to be two kinds of different moms, right? I heard about that horrible woman, Casey Anthony. Okay. There's hold, two hold, different hold kinds up. of mothers. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Okay, I don't have time there's for all this. There's a mother who tells Do you know your mother's birthday or don't you? I don't. Do not know. She doesn't love me. She does, I don't really know anything Do about her. Do not know her birthday. That's no. a question. Don't. Okay. No. So your, your father is Gonzalez. You don't know his first name. Your she mother is Sabrina Hicks, but you don't know her birthday, and you claim they both live at this 2657 South Jamaica Circle, Cincinnati, Ohio. You don't know the zip code. This address that the detective just mentioned was also told to the officers by Isabella, but she doesn't know that this address doesn't exist. How about a phone number? I did disconnect the house phone like a while ago because you're fucking cheap. Cell phones? I don't have their cell phone numbers. We don't talk to each other. That's why I ran away. It's like... Okay, where does Sabrina... Not, like, not really my family. They're where does Sabrina like, Hicks roommates. work? Maybe we can go to her work. Um, she works at a grocery market. Do you know the name? We don't talk to each other. We're like strangers. She just hates me. She looks at me like with disgust. Like, oh, you illegitimate right, right, child. Right, right, You poor illegitimate child, you... The detectives had asked her if her picture was taken in the high school yearbook, and she'd said that she wasn't present that day. Next, the detectives asked her about her middle school, and this is where she slips. Okay, so the high school yearbook's not going to work for this year. Did you get your picture taken when you were in eighth grade, the year before? Finally, middle school? Uh-huh. I'm sorry? Her name is Pine Lane Middle School. Pine Lane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Funny, I've heard of that one. There's yeah. a Pine Lane here in Colorado. Did you know that? Okay, there are lots of names. No, no, no. It's Pine Lane Middle School. What do you think of that? Pine Lane Middle School. Same one you claim you go to. I don't go there anymore. In Cincinnati, Ohio, there's one right here in Colorado. Man, so what? Aren't there like a million? People are not creative with names. Is your picture in their yearbook? Yeah. Probably somewhere, if you could find it. I don't know if you guys could have that kind of technology. Oh, we can find it. If it exists, we can find it. The Cincinnati police say those, those both, all three of the addresses you gave us, the number any, don't exist. Uh, maybe they don't know every single address in all of Cincinnati. It's the Ohio freaking police city. department. If they don't know, who, do, who knows? Yeah, what do you want you called me to do? Where were I'm they not go? Isabella. We just I want you to tell the Do you truth. understand how complicated you've made this? I am not Isabella. I know you guys know that. Okay. okay. If you're not Samantha, then who are you? I am Samantha. I'm not Isabella. That's all that matters. I'm not a murderer. Yay, I can leave. The problem is, is each lie you tell... It's not a lie. you got to tell another lie. And then you forget the lies you've already told. And pretty soon it becomes so confusing and so overwhelming that you don't know what you said. This address you gave is bogus. The Cincinnati police say it's not a good address. It's a good address I don't know what to tell you. How do you explain that? The detectives were now frustrated with their outright lies. We have been so patient with you, giving you every opportunity. Oh, my God. Please do Oh, are you getting upset? Are you getting you, upset? You would. If this happened to you. You make me upset. Uh, I haven't done anything to you. You've you really lied. Continually over and over and over today. You've wasted our time. You're wasting my time. I didn't... No, no, no. Me. Your time means nothing from this point forward. I'm not Your hurting. time is counted in minutes, hours, and days that you're going to be spent or will be spent behind bars looking out into a prison cell. You committed a heinous... Okay, you're going to go to prison for that. No, you're not getting out of jail no, anytime soon. No, okay? And the fact that you can sit there with that stupid goddamn look on your face makes me sick. It makes you me physically sick, sick to look at you. Do the DNA test that will prove me right. Don't tell me how to do my job. Why are you Don't saying? tell me how to do my job. I haven't done anything to you. You've come in here and tried to fucking act like you're so goddamn smart. What do you mean? 
You're putting your life in your hands today, my friend. With all the commotion happening, the detectives were left with only one way out, calling her father. But Isabella knew what to do. Who's that? That's my baby. Okay. Sir, do you recognize, do you recognize this? Which one? Why don't you come on back out here for a second? Do you recognize her? Yeah, she's my daughter. What's her, what's her name? Isabella. Isabella, yeah. what's her last name? Guzman. Isabella Guzman, okay. Uh, right. This photograph here, is that photograph? <clears throat> is that your daughter there? Yeah. Okay. And this is your daughter here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and we'll sit back here and then we'll see about come back later. Okay. 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 Is he insane? Does she have like a crazy family? <coughs> like a completely crazy family? Is that why she's psychotic and killed her mom? My name is Samantha. Who is that man? No matter the tricks, Isabella was not going to let her guard down. Was this planned, or was she really delusional? It was now time for Isabella to play her own tricks. Okay. Yeah, you seem like a nice person who made a genuine mistake. I'm not mad at you. Please just do the no, DNA no, no, test. Listen to me. You have no business judging me, okay? What do, do you not, mean? Do not judge me. Do not tell me I'm a nice person. He is not my dad. Do not tell me anything like that that makes me mad, okay? Isabella's trick, or desperate attempt rather, to show sympathy towards the detectives was failing miserably. And the detectives knew that. Next, they moved to Isabella's next lie. I told you the truth about who I am because I have to hear the police. I'm not required to tell the truth about my life to anyone else. Okay? Let me ask you a question. What? When you went into H Mart today, were you covered in blood? No. Oh, yes, you were. No, I was You're on the video. You went into H Mart and you told them that you were somebody tried to sexually assault you. Because I have bleeding hands. And they asked what happened to you. Mm -hmm. I have blood all over my hands, yeah, kind of. And I really got the chance to clean it. I left in such a hurry. They gave me some proper nail scoring and shit. I did tell them something because I needed help, yes. I'm not gonna lie. But I did not tell them about my family and my mom, okay? I did tell them someone tried to kill me, I'm not going to lie to you, because I don't want them to know all about my family. They're not the police. I don't have to tell them who I am, I just need to help. I'm ashamed of who I am. It's better to be the victim than the abused, beaten girl. Yes, I lied to them, okay, but I have not lied to you. But that's not the story you told us when you sat down here and we asked you about these bags and where you got them and yes. the circumstances. Yes, clothes are mine. That's not the story you told us. The pads they got for me, and they gave me proper bandages. Yeah, that's not the story you, you told us, okay? Plain and simple, it's not. You told us something completely different. You're scared of me. Didn't you? You told us something completely different. Because you lied, right? I haven't lied. Yes, you did. That's a lie. Just do the DNA test. It will prove everything. And then I can be happy for the first time in my life. That's all I've ever wanted. I wanted true love like I want in my books. After all these efforts, it was looking as if the detectives were succeeding in scaring Isabella. And now the truth could be revealed any time. We've given you I all the opportunities. my life was going to be better when I ran away. I guess that's only going to get worse. I'll probably get fucked in prison too because I'm pretty. She once again mentions her appearance, a behavior observed when her mother alerted the police. On that occasion, she was asked if she wanted to take her own life. She then asked the detectives how someone so pretty could want that. This pattern of behavior repeated itself, highlighting her obsession with her physical appearance again, proving that she was, in fact, Isabella. See how aggressive she gets when the police didn't share her views about her appearance. I don't think you're pretty. That's mean. I don't think you are either. And after this, it was pure aggression from her side. It's going to be dark soon. When are the DNA tests going to come back? I don't want to walk around in the dark. Again. You're going to jail. You're not going anywhere. Else. Man, fuck you. Well, that's the way it's going to be. We're going to have the John Nurse come over, have her look at the okay. wounds, and then we'll build a talk there. 
She's probably killed the hospital. She's probably in that one. Yeah, we're just trying to make you know, same stuff. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm not going to fucking jail unless you fucking photoshop my fucking eyes. Okay. Um, Do you see her fucking face? She has fucking brown eyes. Okay. I fucking hate you fucking people. All you people fucking suck. And that bitch is probably fucking crazy as shit and she's gonna go kill somebody else. At least we can take some happiness in that. Why do you think I I was being happy? I'm gonna die, at least you're fucking going down with me. Alrighty. Can you stand up for me? We're gonna go over to the hospital and get your hands stitched up, okay? Yeah, that's for the jail. Why? Because that's... We're gonna get your hands stitched up. Both of them. Put your hands behind your back. Why? Why are... Ow, 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 that's Hang where on. I stopped. Okay. Hang on. Just relax. Let's take the fucking DNA test here. Because it hasn't been six to eight months yet, like I told you. I hate you. I know. I saw you. Samantha. It was a lot of swearing from her side, but in the end, the detectives were unable to get a confession from her, and it was now time for her court hearing. On September 5, 2013, Isabella made her first court appearance. As she entered the courtroom, she shot glares at the news cameras and made peculiar hand gestures around her eyes. A smirk played on her lips as she scrunched up her nose. In a Colorado court, after numerous psychological evaluations, a doctor testified that Isabella suffered from schizophrenia and had been battling paranoid delusions for years. In her mind, Yun Mi wasn't her mother, but someone named Cecilia, and she believed that she had to kill her to save the world. Isabella was deemed not guilty by reason of insanity and was placed in Pueblo State Mental Hospital. Regardless of the outcome, the tragic death of a mother at the hands of the very individual she brought into existence is incredibly heart-wrenching. Much like another incident with a similar occurrence, the murder of Patricia Mary by her own daughter, Anne Travado. If you're interested in delving into that story, you can check it after watching this video. The link's available in the I button as well as in the description box. Coming back to the story, in 2020, videos of Isabella's arraignment resurfaced and went viral on TikTok. She gained a following with some people sympathizing with her. People went crazy over this. A viral trend exploded on TikTok, with youngsters worldwide mimicking Isabella's eerie gestures while playing the song Sweet But Psycho by Ava Max in the background. The trend was bizarre, to say the least. In November 2020, she petitioned for her release, claiming she was no longer mentally ill. She alleged experiencing abuse from her mother, and in June 2021, she was allowed supervised therapy sessions outside the hospital with a GPS tracking device. In 2020, CBS snagged an exclusive Zoom interview with Isabella. She asserted that she's doing well now, content with her medication, and desiring freedom. And I have since been restored to full health. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I left the religion when I was 14. And the abuse at home worsened after I quit. The fight with my mom was terrible, and um, I was injured in the process. I have the scars on my hands. Um, I don't know if you can see or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. If I could change it, or if I could take it back, I would. Her words to CBS were, I wasn't myself back then. I endured years of abuse from my family at home. She claimed her mental health had improved, and she posed no threat to herself or others. According to CBS, Isabella also disclosed in 2015 that she was physically assaulted by a hospital employee in the closet. Though reported to the police, the incident only reached the district attorney in 2021. For some reason, too much time had passed, and the outcome remains unknown to the public. Isabella is still at the Colorado State Mental Institution, and she maintains she deserves freedom. But nevertheless, 
Yun Mi Hoi was not served justice, and neither was Ryan Hoi. The crimes of Isabella left her family in pain, both physically and emotionally, with no closure. Isabella still remains in the mental hospital, but her mother never got justice. Do you think that Isabella was really schizophrenic, or was it all a lie? And amidst this, where did Yun Mi Hoi's justice go? As the sun set on January 24th, 2023, Patrick Clancy, a father of three, rushed back to his home in Duxbury, Massachusetts after a brief errand. But what he found there was something out of a nightmare. His wife, Lindsay, lay severely injured in the backyard, and their children, aged five, three, and eight months, were unresponsive in the basement. The entire town was in shock as the news of the tragedy spread like wildfire. And in the investigation that unraveled, the truth was more disturbing than anyone could have ever imagined. What could have possibly happened in that short span of time when Patrick was away? And what secrets were hiding behind the closed doors of the Clancy household? Duxbury, Massachusetts is a small coastal town located about 35 miles southeast of Boston. With a population of just about 16,000 residents, Duxbury is known for its charming New England-style homes and historic landmarks. The town also boasts a number of beautiful parks and recreation areas, including Duxbury Beach, where residents and visitors can enjoy swimming, fishing, and boating. Overall, Duxbury is a charming and idyllic town that offers something for everyone. Whether you're interested in history, outdoor recreation, or the arts, there's plenty to see and do in this picturesque coastal community. And it's here that our story begins. In 2016, Patrick and Lindsay Clancy tied the knot in a beautiful ceremony that left everyone in awe. Fast forward to two years later in 2018, the couple took a leap of faith and purchased a charming home on 47 Summer Street in Duxbury, Massachusetts. It was the start of a new chapter in their lives. As their love bloomed, so did their family. In the space of six years, the couple were blessed with three beautiful children. In 2018, they welcomed their firstborn, a delightful girl they named Cora. And two years later, their family grew with the arrival of a bouncing baby boy named Dawson. But that wasn't the end. On May 26, 2022, the Clancy's welcomed their newest bundle of joy, a baby boy named Callan. The Clancy's children were a beautiful blend of unique personalities, and their journey together was nothing short of enchanting. Cora, for instance, was a beautiful girl with a heart of gold. She dreamed of being a doctor and a mother someday, and often practiced by giving her little brother Callan checkups, which melted her parents' hearts. Dawson, the second-born, had bold brown eyes that sparkled with warmth and friendship. He had a natural talent for humor and was incredibly generous, always willing to share his toys with others. The youngest of the Clancy Bunch, Callan, was the epitome of a happy baby. From the moment he was born, he hardly ever fussed and was always smiling. His parents affectionately nicknamed him Happy Callan because of this. Lindsay and Patrick were the ultimate parenting duo, with a deep love and devotion to their children that knew no bounds. Lindsay was the embodiment of motherhood, paying close attention to every little detail when it came to her kids. As a labor and delivery nurse at Massachusetts General Hospital, Lindsay was no stranger to caring for others, but her passion for her children knew no bounds. Her love for them was evident in everything she did, from working out while carrying her little ones to pushing Dawson in his stroller while Cora pedaled her tricycle beside her. Every moment spent with her children was precious to her, and she savored every second. Patrick was no less dedicated to his family. 
He was a businessman and had a home office in the basement of the family house. But despite his busy schedule, he was always eager to take his kids on adventures and explore the world with them. From scooting through the park to skiing down the slopes, nothing was too big or small for this loving father. He knew that his children were his purpose in life, and he never took that responsibility for granted. Watching them grow and thrive was a true joy for him, and he knew that his love for them would only continue to grow with each passing day. For a while, life seemed to be going perfectly for the Clancy family. They were happy, healthy, and filled with love. But all of that was about to change in an instant when tragedy struck without warning. On the morning of January 24, 2023, the world was coated in a pristine blanket of snow. Lindsay and her daughter Cora were up early for Cora's pediatrician appointment. Lindsay, who'd been on maternity leave since her youngest son, Callan, was born, was eager to ensure that her daughter was in perfect health. After their appointment, Lindsay and Cora returned home and joined Dawson outside in the snow. They giggled and played in the snow and built a magnificent snowman. Lindsay captured the moments through pictures, sharing the joy with her mum and husband. The day quickly went by, and as the afternoon set in, Lindsay began to think about dinner plans. She searched online for the driving time to the 3V, a restaurant in Plymouth. Later, at 4.47 p.m., she phoned CVS Pharmacy in Kingston to inquire about children's Miralax, a laxative medication for kids. Unfortunately, the manager informed her that they didn't have it in stock, but suggested some alternatives. As she got off the phone with the pharmacy, she texted her husband Patrick, who was working in his home office in the basement, asking if he wanted to order takeout for dinner. He agreed and she quickly placed an order for a Mediterranean power bowl for herself and a scallop and pork belly risotto for him. She also asked him to pick up the kid's medication on his way back. At 5.10 p.m., the order was placed and a few minutes later, Patrick headed out to pick up the takeout and medication. As the clock struck 5.33 p.m., Patrick pulled into the CVS pharmacy parking lot in Kingston. He rushed to the children's aisle and reached for his phone to call Lindsay and confirm the medication they needed, but there was no answer. A minute later, Lindsay called back and was able to confirm what he was to get. He picked up the food, and the Mediterranean power bowl and scallop and pork belly risotto filled his senses. He couldn't wait to get back home to enjoy the meal with his family. But as he drove back home, blissfully unaware of the tragedy unfolding, he had no idea that his life was about to change forever. As Patrick pulled into the driveway of his home, he couldn't help but notice the eerie silence that hung in the air. There were no sounds of laughter or giggles from his kids, which was highly unusual. His heart racing, he quickly got out of the car and made his way to the house. As he stepped inside, he called out for his wife and children, but there was no response. The emptiness of the house made him feel like he had entered a horror movie set. He began to ascend the stairs, his heart beating faster and faster with each step. When he reached their second floor bedroom, he found the door locked. This made him suspicious and his mind raced with thoughts of what could have happened. He jiggled the handle of the door a few times, but it wouldn't budge. Growing impatient and scared, he eventually forced the door open and his eyes fell upon a gruesome sight. The floor was covered in blood and the window was wide open, flapping in the breeze. Fear gripped his heart. A quick glance outside the window and his worst fears were confirmed. Lindsay was lying motionless on the ground 20 feet below. It was a scene straight out of a nightmare. As he stumbled out of the bedroom and rushed to the backyard, his mind was in a frenzy. He found his wife lying broken on the ground with blood pooling around her wrists. His heart sank at the sight, but he was relieved to see that she was still breathing and conscious. When he asked her what had happened, she told him to his surprise that she tried to kill herself and jumped out of the bedroom window. Patrick's mind went into overdrive. How could this be happening? He quickly dialed 911 and... 
uh, slit her. Um, she's in the, looks like they're pinging around the back. We'll, uh, get that info now. I'm gonna get all three mutual aids at this time. I'm getting you three mutual aid ambulances. Yeah. I struck the boss, we got three on the way. Explain the situation to the operator. As he waited for the ambulance, he wondered where their children were. Lindsay informed him that they were in the basement. Patrick's heart raced as he sprinted down to the basement, his worst fears coming to life before his eyes. He shouted out for his beloved children, Cora, Callan, and Dawson, but there was no response. As he reached the den area, his heart sank. The sight before him was unimaginable. The children lay motionless on the ground with exercise bands wrapped tightly around their necks. Patrick's hands shook as he frantically tried to remove the bands, begging his children to breathe. But it appeared to be too late. The children had been strangled and were not responding. The weight of the tragedy was too much for him to bear. The sound of sirens in the distance jolted Patrick out of his despair. Officers and paramedics arrived and immediately took over, loading the children into ambulances and rushing them to Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, Plymouth. Meanwhile, Lindsay was also transported to South Shore Hospital in Weymouth for treatment. The clock ticked as Patrick waited for news concerning his family. His heart was heavy with grief and fear as they prayed for his children's survival. However, at 7.28 p.m., his world came crashing down when the doctors delivered the devastating news that Cora and Dawson had passed away. His heart shattered into a million pieces, and Patrick struggled to come to terms with the tragedy that had befallen his family. But amidst the darkness, a glimmer of hope emerged. Callan, miraculously, was still fighting for his life. The doctors were able to revive him, and he was quickly transported by medical flight to the Boston Children's Hospital. Though he was in critical condition, the medical team continued to work tirelessly to save his life. Patrick clung on to the hope that his youngest child would pull through the nightmare and bring light back to his shattered world. On the 25th of January, 2023, which was the day after the heartbreaking event, the authorities issued an arrest warrant for Lindsay on multiple charges, including two counts of homicide and three counts of strangulation. As the investigation progressed, it became clear that Lindsay had played a role in the murder of her own children. The news shook the entire community to its core. People couldn't comprehend how a mother who seemed so normal could take the lives of her own children. Amidst the chaos, Lindsay remained unconscious in the hospital unable to explain the motive behind her actions. The once peaceful town continued to grieve for the innocent lives lost and struggled to come to terms with the reality of what had transpired. The morning of January 27, 2023 was a dark one as little Callan's fight for life came to a heartbreaking end at 11.18 a.m. Despite the valiant efforts of the medical staff at Boston Children's Hospital, the eight-month-old had suffered permanent brain damage. His tiny body could not withstand the damage inflicted by the exercise band around his neck. It was a tragedy that shook the entire community to its core. Meanwhile, Lindsay, who'd been unconscious for days, finally opened her eyes. Although she was intubated, she used a whiteboard to communicate her thoughts. Her body had suffered immense damage from the fall and she was paralyzed from the waist down. But even in her vulnerable state, the authorities did not hesitate to press charges against her. The evidence was overwhelming and there was no escaping the truth. The road to justice for the tragic events of January 24th was just beginning. Patrick finally found the courage to speak up on January 28th, 2023. His heart-wrenching post on the family's GoFundMe page left a lump in the throats of thousands who read it. Devastated and shattered by the loss of his precious children, Cora, Dawson, and Callan, he poured out his heart in the post. He talked about the unimaginable pain and shock he was going through and how he felt completely lost without his children who were the essence of his life. Despite everything, 
he found it in his heart to forgive Lindsay and asked others to do the same. He also reminded everyone that the real Lindsay was generously loving and caring towards everyone. Following the post, the outpouring of support and love for Patrick and his family was immense, with people from all over the world donating to the family's medical bills, funeral services, and legal help. On February 6, 2023, Lindsay made a phone call to her husband in the presence of Dr. Paul Ziesel, a renowned psychologist who had been hired by her lawyer to assess her mental state. In that call, she made a shocking confession that left everyone stunned. Lindsay revealed that after Patrick had left their home on January 24th, she'd experienced a moment of psychosis and heard voices in her head. She claimed that a man's voice had instructed her to take the lives of her precious children and to end her own life, as it was her last chance to do so. The gravity of her words left Patrick and the psychologist speechless, and the implications of her confession left them with a lot to contemplate. The shocking truth behind why Lindsay had committed such a terrible crime was revealed after a thorough mental evaluation. It was discovered that she'd been struggling with postpartum depression. Becoming a mother is often viewed as one of the most joyous experiences in a woman's life. However, this isn't always the case. Postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis are two conditions that can arise after giving birth and they can be incredibly challenging to navigate. Postpartum depression is a form of clinical depression that affects mothers after childbirth. It can be caused by hormonal changes, lack of sleep, and stress. Symptoms may include feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and difficulty in sleeping. Postpartum psychosis, on the other hand, is a rare but severe condition that occurs in about one to two out of every thousand births. It's characterized by delusions, hallucinations, and confusion. Women with a history of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia are at a higher risk of developing postpartum psychosis. Both conditions require prompt medical attention to ensure the safety and well-being of both mother and baby. In the months leading up to the tragedy, Lindsay had sought help from psychiatrists due to overwhelming feelings of anxiety and depression Despite being diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, she continued to struggle with her mental health and was prescribed a staggering 13 different psychiatric medications to manage her symptoms. These included powerful drugs such as clonazepam, Valium, Prozac, Sertraline, and Lorazepam, all of which had significant side effects and potential risks. Despite her husband Patrick's account that she took these drugs as prescribed, Lindsay shared with them in December 2022 that she was in thoughts of harming their children. On January 1, 2023, Lindsay checked herself into McLean Hospital in Massachusetts. After being admitted, she was taken off some medication and put on others before being discharged on January 5th. In the following weeks, her husband Patrick inquired if she was still having thoughts and Lindsay responded that she was not. As all these details about Lindsay's mental health emerged, it became clear that her actions might have been as a result of her struggles with postpartum depression. This would later be a key factor in her defense in court. As the camera zoomed in on Lindsay's pale face, she looked almost unrecognizable with a neck brace and mask covering most of her features. It was Tuesday, the 7th of February, 2023, and Lindsay was lying paralyzed in a hospital bed as she appeared for a virtual arraignment via Zoom. This was the first time the public had seen her since the tragic deaths of her children. As the court proceedings began, both Lindsay's defense attorney, Kevin Reddington, and the prosecutors were in agreement that her family knew of her worsening depression and unsettling thoughts following the birth of her son, Callan, in May 2022. Following this, Reddington argued that Lindsay had been suffering from postpartum depression and possibly postpartum psychosis, but prosecutors refuted the claim. She never indicated that she was hallucinating, delusional, or had disordered thoughts or speech. The exchange was tense, with both sides trying to prove their point. In a shocking turn of events, prosecutors revealed that Lindsay had been keeping notes on her phone about her feelings. She wrote in her journal that at times she 
fatal ideation in December of 2022, and she also told her husband that she had suicidal thoughts and on one occasion had thoughts of harming her children. But she did not write or voice those thoughts after a stay at McLean Hospital. When she had those thoughts, she consulted with a psychiatrist and with her husband, and then she committed herself to McLean Hospital on January 1st, 2023. She was discharged by the hospital on January 5th, 2023. And the hospital did not file any paperwork at that time, attempting to have her committed as a danger to herself or others. The revelation left everyone in the courtroom speechless, shedding light on the extent of Lindsay's mental struggles. Prosecutors also made another shocking revelation about Lindsay's state of mind after her children's death. They stated that three days after the incident, while still intubated and barely conscious, Lindsay reportedly scribbled a note saying she needed an attorney. Prosecutors pointed out this was one of the first things she asked about, suggesting that she was fully aware of her actions and their consequences. In their view, this showed that Lindsay was not suffering from a complete lack of mental capacity, but rather acted with a degree of intentionality. Due to this, prosecutors further argued that the murders of Lindsay's children were not impulsive acts, but had been meticulously planned. The defendant did not take advantage of the situation when her husband left the home that night. She created the situation. And she used Apple Maps to make sure she would have enough time to strangle each child before her husband returned from where she had sent him. The defendant is a danger to herself and others. She planned these murders, gave herself the time and privacy needed to commit the murders, and then she strangled each child in the place where they should have felt the safest, at home with their mom. The evidence came from her phone records, which showed the searches she made on the day of the murders. The air was thick with tension as Lindsay's defense attorney, Reddington, rose to address the court. He argued that the murders of Lindsay's three young children were not premeditated, but rather a tragic result of the country's failure to properly address the mental health needs of new mothers. Reddington painted a vivid picture of a woman who was failed by the medical professionals who were supposed to help her. He pointed out that Lindsay was prescribed a cocktail of medications that did more harm than good, leaving her unable to experience genuine emotions. We all know that this woman is, as counsel concedes apparently, a danger to herself. I, I, I question whether she would ever make it to a trial. She, she's extremely emotional. However, she's unable and has been unable to express any happiness or sadness or cry. And in fact, sometime about a month or two ago, uh, she made the comment, I just wish that I could feel something. The drugs had left her in such a state that she was now under 24-7 suicide watch. The defense attorney's words were met with mixed reactions in the courtroom. Some nodded in agreement, while others seemed skeptical of his claims. As the courtroom proceedings continued, a wave of letters of support for Lindsay flooded in, telling stories of their own struggles with postpartum depression and rallying to her defense. From old friends to complete strangers, each letter vouched for her character, slamming her extensive list of medications and expressing their firm belief that Lindsay could not have been responsible for the death of her three beloved children. The letters carried a common thread of empathy and understanding towards the struggles that women face during and after pregnancy, and a collective call to arms for the need for more resources and support for women suffering from postpartum depression. As the courtroom drama continued, the prosecution made it clear that they were not buying Lindsay's attorney's defense strategy. They strongly rejected the idea that she was a mere victim of excessive medication and antidepressants. With the stakes high, they pushed for her to be kept in custody without bail. The judge, however, ruled that Lindsay would remain in the undisclosed hospital, where she'd been since the day she allegedly killed her three children. Lindsay's fate now rests in the hands of a grand jury who will decide whether she should be charged with murder. The suspense is palpable as everyone awaits the decision. Her next court date is on July 25th, 2023, and it remains to be seen what the future holds for this tragic case.
The case of Lindsay Clancy and the tragic deaths of her three children has left many questions unanswered. It is indeed a heartbreaking and complex situation that has shaken the community. As we reflect on this case, it raises important questions about mental health, the postpartum period, and the support available for women who are struggling. What more can be done to ensure that women receive the help they need during this vulnerable time? And how can we prevent tragedies like this from happening in the future? May 10th, 2007, in the tranquil village of Kujim, Czech Republic, an ordinary evening took a chilling turn for a hopeful father. Eager to ensure the safety of his newborn, he carefully installed a CCTV baby monitor, unknowingly setting in motion a sequence of events that would haunt him forever. As he peered expectantly at the monitor's display, anticipating the serene sight of his slumbering child in the crib, the CCTV picked up a different signal nearby. A shocking and horrifying scene unfurled before his eyes. A young boy, barely dressed, with his fragile limbs cruelly restrained behind his back. The boy looked very thin and weak, and he was desperately trying to find food on the floor. His malnourished appearance sent shivers down the father's spine, leaving him with unsettling questions. From which of his neighbors was the video feed coming from? Who was the young boy captured on the baby monitor's screen? Kujim is a charming town located in Brno County District in the South Moravian region of the Czech Republic. With a population of approximately 11,000 as of today, it offers a close-knit community vibe. This quaint destination boasts cultural landmarks like the Kujim Castle and the Church of St. Mary Magdalene, drawing history enthusiasts from far and wide. And here, our story begins. Back in 2005, in the small town of Kujim, Czech Republic, there lived two sisters, 31-year-old Clara Marova, born 1975, and 33-year-old Katerina Marova. Not much is known about their early lives, but Clara had a degree in pedagogy, the study of the methods and activities of teaching. Katerina, on the other hand, worked at a youth center called Papsek. What intrigued those who knew them was the deep belief the sisters shared. They often spoke about a divine mission that awaited them, a calling from God that would shape their destinies. Now, Clara was also a single mother who found herself with the responsibility of taking care of two boys, Jacob, age nine, and his younger brother, Andre, who was eight. Clara had been married before, but the details about her husband, the duration of their marriage, and the circumstances of their separation remain unclear. Some attributed the breakup to what was labeled as Clara's unusual behavior and beliefs, which were thought to be related to her battle with schizophrenia. Despite the challenges she faced, those who knew Clara had nothing but praise for her motherly nature. She was the epitome of a loving and caring mother, always taking proper care of Jacob and Andre. Clara delighted in playing with them, taking them on exciting vacations, and enrolling them in summer camps to create beautiful memories. However, the tranquil life they'd built together began to change when a new child entered their lives. From that moment on, life would never be the same for Clara, Jacob, and Andre. The new child was a 13-year-old Norwegian orphan named Annika. She had an interesting connection with Katerina, Clara's sister, who somehow took her under her wing. We don't know all the details of how they met, but it's possible they crossed paths at the youth center where Katerina worked. One day, Katerina decided to visit her sister Clara, and she took Annika along with her. Now, this wasn't just any ordinary visit, because Annika had quite a tale to share. She bravely revealed that she was running away from a dangerous trafficking gang in Norway. The poor girl had endured severe hardships at the hands of these criminals. As Annika shared her heart-wrenching story, Clara couldn't help but feel a rush of sympathy and concern. It was a moment that brought the family together, connecting them to this young girl in need. As days turned into weeks, Annika's presence in Clara's home grew stronger. She also portrayed herself as a frail and sickly child, requiring constant medical attention. It was peculiar, though, as she only trusted Katerina to take her to the hospital. It makes one wonder about the reason behind this selective trust. Despite the mystery surrounding Annika, Clara's heart softened towards her, and she wholeheartedly embraced the young girl as part of her family. Annika had found a loving and caring mother figure in Clara, and the bond between them continued to grow. But amidst this new chapter in their lives, something else was brewing on the horizon. 
The two sisters, Claire and Katerina, joined a cult known as the Grail Movement. This cult was under the guidance of a man named Joseph Scorla. The members of the cult held a belief that performing good deeds could secure them a place in heaven, while simultaneously granting them immunity from the repercussions of any crimes committed. It's not exactly clear how, when, or under what circumstances Clara and Katerina joined this group. Now, as the two sisters ventured further into the folds of the Grail movement, they would soon discover that their newfound beliefs came with unforeseen consequences. The cult's allure would pull them into a world where the line between right and wrong became blurred. Shortly after Annika became a part of the family, strange texts and emails began flooding Clara's phone. These messages were from an unknown sender claiming to be a doctor with a perfect treatment plan for Annika. The messages were cryptic yet compelling, urging Clara to meet this mysterious doctor in person to discuss Annika's care. Curiosity got the best of her, and they arranged to meet late at night inside a car. On the day of the meeting, Clara could not get a clear look at the man's face since it was dark. However, he presented Annika's medical records and even flashed a diplomatic passport, which somewhat reassured Clara about his credibility. Feeling a sense of trust in the stranger, Clara accepted him as Annika's new and official doctor. However, little did she know that this encounter would set off a chain of unsettling events. As time passed, the texts and emails from the doctor took a strange turn. He'd suggest bizarre treatment plans, like instructing her to rub Annika's body, especially her private regions, for hours, claiming it would bring happiness to the young girl. This was simply weird, to say the least. As the days went by, something changed in Clara. Her attention seemed to drift away from her sons, and so she began leaving them in the care of their grandparents. This shift in focus coincided with Clara's growing idea of adopting Annika into their family. However, a strange twist came into play when the doctor, who'd been sending those mysterious messages, told Clara that adoption would be impossible due to her son's alleged mistreatment of Annika. It's unclear whether this accusation held any truth or if it was just a manipulation tactic. With her heart torn and unsure of what to do, Clara turned to the doctor for advice. Shockingly, he suggested a rather disturbing solution to her dilemma. Curing her son's evil spirits through extreme discipline, tough love, and physical punishments. In a twist that nobody saw coming, Clara began to discipline her sons with relentless severity, as if she were seeking any excuse to inflict pain upon them. It was shocking and heartbreaking to witness. She resorted to beating them with her bare hands, wooden spoons, and belts, and even subjected them to the cruelty of being locked up in small rooms overnight. It was difficult to comprehend how Claire's actions had taken such a dark turn. Perhaps her struggle with schizophrenia played a part, clouding her judgment and making it easier for her to carry out these drastic measures. Regardless of what it was, Clara's family was now entangled in a web of pain and turmoil. The once-loving mother seemed lost, as if consumed by a darkness that had engulfed her soul. The path ahead held an uncertain future for everyone involved, and the question remained whether there would be a way to break free from this disturbing cycle of pain and find the light amidst the shadows that had taken hold. In August of 2006, something bizarre and troubling happened. The doctor who'd been advising Clara about her sons dropped a bombshell. He said her punishments weren't working, and in a surprising turn of events, he suggested an even more radical approach. Clara should stop acting like their mother altogether. It was an astonishing and bewildering idea, but Clara followed the doctor's instructions nonetheless. That's not even the craziest part. The doctor also suggested she take them to this small cottage in Verveska Batishka, out in the woods, far away from prying eyes. This remote spot was a mere 13-minute drive from their home in Kujim. Clara was torn between this bizarre advice and her desperate need to fix her sons. However, in the end, she decided to go along with it. She packed her boys up and whisked them away to that secluded cottage. Upon reaching the cottage, they were met by Katerina, Clara's sister, along with two men. One was named Jan Skla, while the other was named Jan Turek. Another woman, Hanna Bashova, whom Clara knew from a past summer camp, was also part of the group. This seemingly innocent gathering at the cottage would mark the beginning of an unthinkable ordeal for the two young boys. The cottage walls would bear witness to unspeakable horrors and unimaginable acts of cruelty afflicted upon the innocent souls who deserved nothing but love and care. The boys were kept locked up inside tiny dog cages. 
The cages were so small, they couldn't even stand up properly or move around much. And to add to the cruelty, they were forced to eat from dog bowls and use the bathroom right there in the cages, leaving them sitting in their own filth. But it didn't stop at that. The boys were forbidden to talk to each other, to their own mother or to anyone else present. The mental torture was simply unbearable. And then came the water torture. Clara would dunk their heads underwater for what felt like an eternity. The boys were terrified, thinking they might drown. And to make matters worse, Katerina would hold their arms behind their backs, leaving them defenseless against their own mother's cruelty. It was just sickening to think about the pain and suffering those boys endured. They were scratched with forks and subjected to unimaginable ordeals. They were forced to fight each other, tied up like animals. And it wasn't just Clara and Katerina that carried out this abuse on the boys. The others joined in too. They would tie bags around the boys' heads, cutting off their air and further tormenting them. But the horrors didn't stop there. At one point, they even cut flesh from Andre's buttocks and burned the wound with cigarettes. And, unbelievably, they made him eat his own flesh. The others also had joined in eating the raw human flesh. The depravity of it all is just beyond words. They didn't stop at just one act of savagery. They continued taking skin from other parts of the boys' bodies, forcing them to eat their own flesh. And if that wasn't enough, they even made them eat their vomit. The boys' screams must have been unbearable, so they made sure to tape their mouths shut to silence them. The following month, in September of 2006, Clara decided to pursue the adoption of Annika once again, and this time her efforts were successful. Following this, Clara made a shocking decision to hand over her own sons to Katerina. She thought it would be better to focus solely on caring for Annika, whom she believed needed extra attention. So the boys moved out to live with their aunt. But in January 2007, things took a dark and terrifying turn. The boys and Katerina moved back in with Clara, and that's when the nightmare began anew. This time, their abuse was even worse. Clara locked them up in a cement cellar, like they were prisoners in their own home. It was like the horrors from the cottage followed them back, haunting their every step. To make matters even more distressing, Clara installed a TV baby monitor in the cellar, enabling her to observe and relish in the suffering of her own sons from the comfort of her kitchen. All the while, Annika lived in a completely different world, her own bedroom brightly lit and filled with toys. It was like she was living in a different reality, oblivious to the torment her brothers were enduring. For several months, the boys remained chained in that dark, desolate cellar. They were trapped in a cycle of suffering, and there seemed to be no escape for them. As fate would have it, May 10th, 2007 became the day when the truth that had been hidden for far too long finally came to light. It all began when a man named Edward, who lived close to Clara's family home, set up a CCTV baby monitor for his newborn son. Baby monitors can sometimes be glitchy and pick up signals from nearby monitors, and that's exactly what happened on that fateful day. Instead of seeing his own son's crib on the monitor, Edward was met with a disturbing sight. There was a young boy, completely naked, with his arms and legs tied up behind his back. The young boy he saw was Andre. He looked dirty, unhealthy, and was eating off the floor. And there was a woman's hand feeding him. Edward was understandably alarmed and wasted no time in calling the police. The authorities went door to door, determined to find the source of this disturbing footage. When they reached Clara's home, things took a sinister turn. Clara and Katerina refused to open a locked door within their house. This raised serious concerns, so the firemen stepped in, breaking down the door. What they found inside was nothing short of a nightmare. There were the two boys, battered and malnourished, locked away like prisoners in a cement cellar. Clara and Katerina were swiftly arrested for their horrifying actions. The two boys, along with Annika, were then taken to a children's home called Cloak Neck. Days later, Annika disappeared from the children's home. As the investigation progressed, the authorities stumbled upon a revelation that shook the very foundation of the case. Annika, the supposed 13-year-old girl, was not who she claimed to be. In a startling twist, it was uncovered that Annika was, in fact, a 33-year-old woman named Barbara Sklorova. Barbara had been able to deceive everyone by exploiting her condition called hypopituitarism, which made her appear much younger and smaller than her actual age. It was a cunning ploy that allowed her to assume the identity of a vulnerable teenager and gain entry into Clara's family. 
Barbara's deception added a new layer of intrigue to the unfolding story. It raised questions about her true intentions and the reasons behind her infiltration into Clara's family. The truth was far more complex than anyone had anticipated, and the authorities now had to untangle the web of deceit surrounding this mysterious woman. For eight long months, her whereabouts remained a mystery, leaving everyone wondering what had become of her. Then, out of the blue, she resurfaced in the city of Tromsø, Norway. As the pieces of her journey were put together, it was revealed that after fleeing the children's home, she first went to Denmark before finding her way to Oslo, Norway. To successfully enter Norway undetected, she used the passport of a 13-year-old boy named Adam Falno, which had been supplied by the boy's parents. In an astonishing display of deception, Adam's parents went to great lengths to convince authorities that Barbara was, in fact, their son. To add further credibility, Adam's father, Martin Farner, even accompanied Barbara to Norway, reinforcing the illusion. Once in Norway, she assumed the identity of Adam. She took extreme measures, shaving her head and concealing her true self to deceive teachers, police, and childcare workers who were all unsuspecting of her real age. With her new persona, she managed to gain admission into a school. However, it wasn't long before history repeated itself, and she ran away once again. She found refuge in a Norwegian children's home. Then, on December 16, 2007, she mysteriously vanished from the home. Eventually, she was found, on January 5, 2008, and her true identity was exposed. With this, the authorities learned the shocking truth around the woman posing as a young boy. She was subsequently deported back to the Czech Republic to face charges related to her fraudulent identity and to be put on trial for her involvement in the abuse of the innocent children of the family she'd once pretended to be a part of. Additionally, the man who aided her, Martin Farno, faced his own reckoning. He was arrested and confronted with charges in Norway for providing false testimony in support of her deceitful act. During the trial, which took place in June 2008, Barbara claimed that her actions were driven by a desire to escape her own troubled life. However, she denied any participation in the abuse of Andre and Jacob, According to her, she was also a victim of Clara and Katerina's violence. Despite her claims, her defense was met with skepticism, and few believed her side of the story. During the court proceedings, Clara tearfully confessed to torturing her sons. She, however, claimed that she'd been under the influence of the mysterious figure known only as the Doctor. She told the court about how this doctor had manipulated her through text messages, instructing her on the abuse and torture she could inflict on her boys. However, the police later made a startling discovery. There was no doctor at all. The phone number linked to the man actually belonged to none other than Katerina, Clara's own sister. It became apparent that Katerina had played a cunning role in this dark saga. Evidence suggested that Katerina had known about Barbara's true identity long before she introduced her to the family as the supposed 13-year-old Annika. Instead of revealing the truth to her sister, she deliberately kept the secret hidden knowing full well how easily Clara could be manipulated. It was a sinister plan that had far-reaching consequences, leading to the suffering of innocent children at the hands of those they should have been able to trust the most. The courtroom was left grappling with the shocking revelations as everyone tried to understand the motives behind such distressing actions. Now, brace yourself for the strangest twist in this already perplexing tale. It turned out that Joseph Skra the leader of the cult known as the Grail Movement, was actually Barbara's biological father. As the pieces fell into place, it became clear that Joseph had played a significant role in the events that transpired. He was the one who provided the documents shown to Clara that fateful night inside the car. But that wasn't all. Jan Skra, one of the men whom Clara had encountered at the cottage at Verveska Batishka, where her sons had endured unimaginable torture, turned out to be Barbara's brother. The shocking revelations only added to the already chaotic and messy affair. Whether Joseph was found or not remains a mystery. Yet justice had its say for the others involved. Clara was sentenced to nine years in prison, while Katerina received a ten-year sentence. The remaining individuals connected to the cottage ordeal were handed sentences ranging from five to seven years. Barbara, who had also played a pivotal role in the disturbing events, was sentenced to five years behind bars. However, she was released after serving half of her sentence, thanks to her lawyer's successful argument about her deteriorating psychological well-being during her time in prison. The judge also imposed five years of probation on Barbara following her release from prison. The fate of the two boys, Jacob and Andre, remains unclear, 
but there are rumors that they were eventually adopted by an American family. In the aftermath of this harrowing case, the children's lives were forever altered by the haunting experiences they endured. The scars of their traumatic past would undoubtedly leave a profound impact on their journey into adulthood. As they embark on the path of healing, one can't help but ponder, will they ever find solace and rebuild their lives after enduring such darkness? My name is Teresa Grimes. This is a story that has been on my mind for 60 some years now. It is about my sisters, Barbara and Petey. Her real name is Patricia Kathleen, but we always called her Petey. She was tall for her age, 12 plus, but very graceful and pretty. Barbara Jean, 15, was very petite and also pretty. We were a poor family. My mother worked hard for us. She said she didn't have to worry about us being kidnapped because we were poor. Little did she know what would happen to our family. On October 18, 1955, the bodies of three young boys, 14-year-old Robert Peterson, 13-year-old John Schusler, and 11-year-old Anton Schusler, were found naked in a ditch. The case changed the community forever. The search for answers was intense, but justice seemed to be an impossible dream as the case went cold for almost 40 years. Who could have committed such a heinous act against innocent young boys? How did they manage to evade justice for so long? Step back in time to the 1950s and discover Chicago's hidden gem, the Northwest Side. Nestled in this district, Norwood Park and Jefferson Park were a haven for people seeking respite from the turbulence of inner city living. The tight-knit community revolved around its parish, Little League, and bowling alleys. With the lowest crime rate in the city, it was a coveted place to raise a family until a tragedy shook this community in 1955. On February 11, 1942, in Cook County, Chicago, Malcolm and Dorothy Peterson welcomed their first child, Robert Bobby Peterson. Robert was the eldest of four siblings, with younger sisters Barbara Ann, seven, and Susan, five, and a little brother named Tommy, who was only three years old. Even as a kid, Robert was known for being neat and orderly, with a room that was always in pristine condition. He was a responsible young man who not only helped out at home, but also participated in various community activities. John Schusler was born to Anton John Schusler Sr. and Eleanor Lillian Holtz Schusler on November 30, 1941. From a young age, John had a passion for sports and was an outstanding kid who stayed out of trouble. Two years later, on November 12, 1943, his brother Anton John Schusler, or Tony as he was called, was born. From a very young age, he knew he wanted to grow up to be a veterinarian. The two brothers were inseparable and did everything together, from hanging out to having the same circle of friends. As the sun set on the quiet streets where John, Anton, and Robert spent their childhood playing sports and exploring their neighborhood, a foreboding sense of something dark and sinister lingered in the air. Something terrible was about to happen. It was October 16, 1955, and a crisp autumn day in Chicago. The two young brothers, 13-year-old John and 11-year-old Anton, hopped on their bikes and pedaled over to their friend Robert's house. They'd already helped their father hang a clothesline in the basement, as he was not feeling well, so they had the day to themselves. John and Anton had each got $1.25 in cash burning a hole in their pockets, and a daring plan to sneak downtown and catch a movie. It was a risky and forbidden adventure for the brothers, but their 14-year-old friend Robert was the expert and was allowed to go. John and Anton Schussler and their friend Robert Peterson, they went to the Loop Theater to see a Walt Disney movie called The African Lion. We believe they were picked up and disappeared. 
His mother, Dorothy, even helped them pick out a film, Disney's The African Lion, for them to watch in the Loop Theater. With a dollar fifty in his hand, Robert bid goodbye to his parents, kissed them according to their family routine, and left the house with the promise of returning home by 8 p.m. As the night grew darker and the clock ticked past eight, panic set in for both families. There was no sign of the boys and no phone calls. Eleanor, John and Anton's mother, made a call to the Peterson house to inquire about the boys. Dorothy, Robert's mother, informed Eleanor that they'd left for downtown, which was a shock for her. The fear only grew when there was no word from the boys, prompting Dorothy Peterson to contact police at the Gale Street station at around 10 p.m. She spoke to Sergeant Petz, who asked the families to contact the police again if the boys didn't return in an hour. The sky had been beautiful blue when the boys had set out on their adventure, but as the day wore on, the weather took a turn for the worse. The stormy night brought heavy rainfall and added an extra layer of anxiety to the neighborhood. Despite the harsh conditions, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Schusler refused to give up their search for their missing sons. They scoured every hamburger place along Milwaukee Avenue and even checked the Loop Theater where the boys had planned to see a movie. But all their efforts turned up nothing. The boys seemed to have vanished into thin air and it became clear that the only option left was to involve the police. Despite their kids attending the same school and being friends, the Peterson and Schusler families had never really crossed paths or spoken to each other. It was as if their lives were running parallel without ever intersecting. Little did they know that their lives were about to become deeply intertwined in a way they never could have imagined. As the police began their search for the missing boys, they asked the parents about the boys' clothing and possessions, hoping to gather any possible clues. They learned that Robert had been wearing a distinctive White Sox jacket, while the other boys were wearing Cubs jackets. But where could they be? The downtown area was hours away by car, so it seemed unlikely that they could have gone that far. Perhaps they'd spent their money on snacks and were walking back home in the heavy rain. Or maybe they'd gone bowling, a favorite activity of the boys. The search continued as theories and ideas were tossed around, but the only thing that was certain was the growing concern of the families involved. As the sun rose on October 17, 1955, the day after the boys' disappearance, the sense of unease in the community grew even stronger. The police were baffled as well, as they'd never had a case in that community where a missing child didn't turn up. Although Robert had skipped school a few times before, everyone knew he was responsible and would never leave Anton and John on their own. The detectives decided to visit Farnsworth School on Linder Avenue, where the boys studied, to see if the disappearance had something to do with the school. Principal D.W. Thornton suggested searching the north branch of the Chicago River in the Forest Preserve, as it was a spot known for past incidents of violence. A year before the boys disappeared, a grade school pupil was assaulted by a high school boy near the river. The teachers of the boys, Mrs. Bernice Jonas and Miss Cecilia Schwachton, were distraught and tried to keep their composure. Mrs. Jonas speculated that one or two men might have been trying to attract the attention of the students in the last few days, according to some students. The community was filled with terror, and the detectives knew that if they didn't find the boys soon, rumors and speculations would fog the truth. The detectives had their work cut out for them. With 60,000 people in the area, they had a lot of doorbells to ring and a vast area to cover. They knew they had to narrow down the search locations to increase their chances of success. So they began by checking the Loop Theater and contacting the bus drivers who were working on the day the boys went missing. One driver, Bruno Mansorini, had a crucial lead. He remembered seeing the boys who matched the description of Robert, John, and Anton getting on his bus at Berto Avenue, showing student ID cards. He dropped them off at Lawrence Avenue, where they were headed to the Jefferson Park Recreation Alleys for bowling. The problem was they hadn't asked for a transfer slip, which meant they were supposed to get off at Central near the Peterson home. Perhaps that innocent change of plan triggered a horrifying series of events. It seemed like the detectives were finally making some progress in the search for the missing boys. Sightings at the bowling alley provided the next crucial lead. 
Neighbors and relatives of the boys confirmed they'd seen Robert and Anton at Monte Cristo bowling alley, going to take a washroom break while John chatted with a neighbor. The boys left at 8 p.m. after Robert and Anton returned from the washroom. The alley manager, Edward C. Davis, added more information to the mix, revealing that the boys had been there twice that day, once around 3.15 p.m. and again at 7 p.m. They'd not bowled because they didn't have enough money. It raised the question, how did three young boys end up back at the same location where they'd been turned away just hours earlier? Why would they return without any money to bowl? The detectives had a timeline to work with now, and it was up to them to piece together the rest of the puzzle. But there were still gaps in their understanding of what had happened. It was frustrating to know that they were so close to the boys, yet still unable to find them. The atmosphere in the office of Russell Corcoran, the captain of the 33rd Precinct of the Chicago Police Department, was tense and heavy on that fateful day of October 18, 1955. The case of the missing Peterson and Schussler boys had consumed the entire department, and the captain had just finished reassuring the commissioner that they were doing all they could to find them. But then the phone rang again at 1.15 p.m., and the captain answered it, thinking it was just another routine call. But as he listened, his face turned pale and tears welled up in his eyes. After hanging up, the captain made a grim announcement that would haunt the team of detectives forever. Three naked bodies of young boys had been found. The following Tuesday, early in the morning, a uh, liquor salesman had parked his car in Robinson's Woods. He gets out of his vehicle and he examines it closer and realizes these are three young boys, unclad, lying as if they were carelessly tossed from a vehicle. That day, Victor Livingston, a liquor salesman in his mid-fifties, was cruising around in his car, enjoying the fruits of his labor. He'd earned a good amount of money, and he wanted to have his lunch in a tranquil place. So he decided to drive to Robinson Woods Forest Preserve, a picturesque area on the northwest side of Chicago, known for birdwatching and fall colors. But little did he know that he was about to stumble upon something horrific. As he sat in his car, just about to eat, something caught his eye. A body lying motionless on the ground. He quickly drove away to find a phone and call the police. Different authorities came up at the scene as the news spread. When Victor approached the officers asking if they were able to find the body, the officer told him that they'd found three bodies. Since the bodies were dumped in a two-foot deep ditch, only one was visible. The detectives had been searching high and low for the missing boys, but what they found was far more sinister than anyone could have imagined. Just two weeks before Halloween, the boys were discovered naked and stacked on top of each other, with Robert's head bearing a ghastly wound that had long since dried. To make matters worse, the area had already been contaminated, with no chance of finding footprints or any other useful evidence. This was never heard of before, at least within the span of recent memory. So the case became what was known in those days as a heater case in police parlance. When they didn't come home that night, that is really, really began the manhunt. The news hit everyone like a ton of bricks. The detectives were supposed to remain detached from the cases, but that day, tears flowed freely as they mourned the tragic loss of the innocent children. The detectives were left to piece together what little evidence they could find, including the fact that there were no footprints near the bodies, indicating that the boys had been thrown from a car or truck. The killer had covered their tracks well, leaving no trace of the boys' clothing or any other incriminating evidence at the scene. To add to the mystery, there was a significant amount of grease found on their hands, backs, and soles. This led the detectives to believe that the boys were killed somewhere else before being dumped in the woods. Besides, if they'd been killed there, the rain would have washed the blood away. In a harrowing turn of events, an autopsy conducted on the three boys found in the Robinson Woods Forest Preserve revealed that they'd been dead for at least 36 to 40 hours before being discovered. While the initial suspicion was that the boys had been assaulted, the autopsy confirmed that this was not the case. 
However, Dr. Harry R. Hoffman, an associate of the Cook County Behavior Clinic, grimly noted that the person responsible for such a heinous act was likely gratifying their urges through the act itself. Dr. Jerry Kearns was a seasoned professional when it came to examining human remains. He didn't let the gravity of his work follow him home. But the case of the schussler peterson boys would prove to be unforgettable. Anton Jr. had been struck in the neck like a karate chop. But the evidence of fingernail marks on Anton and John's necks suggested that they were strangled. The Schussler boys appeared to have been strangled with bare hands, while Robert had apparently been strangled with a rope. He'd also been savagely beaten about the head 14 times with a rake or some sort of gardening tool, and the other boys had been hit on their faces with what appeared to be the flat side of a knife. Coroner Walter E. McCaro also weighed in on the tragedy, calling it the work of a madman and potentially a gang of older boys. It was noted that Robert John and Anton were likely held captive in a filthy place, bound and gagged with strips of adhesive tape before being dumped in the forest preserve. Dr. Cairns knew that this was no ordinary crime. This was not done by a boy or boys their own age, he declared, nor was it done by a single man of 18 or 20. The killer had attacked from the left rear, and though it had all the markings of a horrendous crime, there was no evidence of assault. Robert had fought for his life with head injuries to prove it. The discovery of the boys' bodies was only the beginning of the horror. Witnesses stepped forward to tell the police they'd seen a car pick up the three boys. A witness even claimed that the car was a Packard, leading to the questioning of nearly a thousand Packard owners. Despite an extensive investigation, which involved questioning over 43,000 people, the killer remained elusive. Anton Schussler Sr., who had lost his two sons, spoke out about the tragedy, saying, When you get to the point that children can't go to the movies in the afternoon and get home safely, something is wrong with the country. But tragedy wasn't finished with the Schussler family yet. Anton Sr., only 41 years old, died of a heart attack just a month after the murders. The life of Eleanor Schussler turned lonelier than ever. She'd lost both her sons and her husband. As time went by, she married Valentine Bud Kujawa and tried to move on with her life, but the memories of the murders never left her. She kept a photograph of the boys and a bronzed baby shoe of each on her dresser as a constant reminder of the children she'd lost. For decades, she lived with the haunting question of what had happened to her boys, and occasional visits from investigators only served as a painful reminder of the unsolved case. Her stepson, Gary Kujawa, remembered how much the murders affected her, saying that she was always reminded of the tragedy. The Peterson family also struggled to cope with their loss. Malcolm, Robert's father, not only lost his son, but also his best friend. Dorothy, Robert's mother, was left so weak by the tragedy that she needed a physician's care. Chicago was a strange place in the months following the murders. Hundreds of officers scoured the streets, desperately trying to find any trace of evidence or even a shred of the boys' clothing. Parents were hesitant to let their children out of their sight, afraid that they too could fall victim to the unknown assailants. The mere thought of leaving their kids at home alone was now out of the question. Doors were locked tightly shut, and even discarding items in the trash seemed like a risky move, as anything suspicious could lead to intense interrogation by the investigating officers. Terror had seeped into every aspect of life, leaving the community paralyzed with fear. Despite the chaos, the investigation pressed on, with the presence of hundreds of uniformed police officers and plainclothes detectives canvassing the neighborhood. Captain Louis Caparelli pulled an additional 200 officers from his detail, all of whom voluntarily surrendered their weekend to assist in the manhunts. It was an unprecedented show of solidarity within the Chicago PD, with one officer remarking, I never saw anything like it. Were they let go in the woods, minus their clothes, and the car drove off? Or were they taken somewhere and given to somebody? This is pretty much where the trail ends. 
but it wasn't until December 7, 1955, that a set of curious markings found on John's left thigh, midway between his knee and hip, caught the attention of the Chicago Daily News. The markings were oval in shape, measuring four inches by two inches, with a pattern of stars and letters imprinted on the fatty layer of tissue below the skin. Most notable was the word bear. Dr. Kearns had missed this detail in his preliminary findings. But that wasn't all that had been missed. Funeral home attendants had discovered shocking bone fractures in the Schusler brothers, which Dr. Kearns had failed to detect. And there was another crucial piece of evidence. Adhesive tape had covered the boys' faces, but it had been removed before the bodies were left in the ditch. The ones who did this crime knew what they were doing, Coroner McCarran concluded. They were careful to remove the tape used to blindfold and gag the victims, since it might have shown fingerprints. The leads that once seemed so promising gradually dwindled away, and the once bustling investigation turned into a silent and stagnant cold case file. The gruesome murders of three young boys in Chicago left investigators with more questions than answers. On Friday, December 28, 1956, they wanted to go to the movies to see Elvis. They were crazy about Elvis Presley. My mother said it was so cold out they shouldn't go. They told her they would be warm and please could they go. My mother relented and said yes. As if the case wasn't puzzling enough, over a year later, on December 28, 1956, two teenage girls, 15-year-old Barbara Grimes and 13-year-old Patricia Grimes, went missing after watching their favorite movie, Love Me Tender. They left the house about 6.30. The movie theater was down Archer Avenue and they would take a bus. So they went to the Brighton Theater. Uh, they were singing Elvis Presley's Love Me Tender. Love me tender, love me sweet, never. Their bodies were found naked on a roadside, similar to the earlier murders. However, unlike the boys, there was no clear cause of death. The coroner's jury ruled that the sisters froze to death. Coroner's official cause of death was basically secondary shock due to cold temperatures. The way they were found wasn't a natural position like two people that froze to death and just kind of fell asleep. But the chief investigator, Harry Gloss, disagreed. He believed that the ice around the bodies showed that they were warm when they were left there and that the puncture wounds in Patricia's chest were signs of violence before death. He also suspected that Barbara had been assaulted, which the pathologists had denied. The eerie similarities between the two cases led to speculation that the same person might have been responsible for both. After decades of frustration and dead ends, it seemed like the case of the murdered boys in Chicago would remain a mystery forever. But then, in 1994, a bombshell dropped. And it wasn't the kind of evidence you see in TV crime dramas. There was no DNA, no fingerprints, no trace evidence examined by a forensics expert. Instead, it was a seemingly innocent comment made by a snitch in a completely unrelated investigation that suddenly opened up a direct path to a suspect in this long dormant investigation. During an investigation into suspected horse killings and the mysterious disappearance of candy heiress and horsewoman Helen Voorhees Brock on February 17, 1977, a breakthrough occurred. When Special Agent Jim Grady and his partner, Mr. Rotuno, began piecing together clues from the horse racing industry, they knew they were entering a world of secrets. As the pieces started to fall into place, the prosecution team found themselves delving into an underworld of murderers, arsonists, swindlers, con men, and even a group known as the Horse Mafia. As they dug deeper, they started hearing whispers about a man named Kenneth Hansen in relation to the boy slayings, who had bragged about the incident to the people he was close with. For years, the case was built from fragments of information culled from this murky world. But somehow, they managed to make it all fit together, painting a vivid picture of what had happened all those years ago, and by the early 1990s, detectives were closing in on Kenneth Hansen. 
Born to Ethan and Lucille Hansen in 1933, Kenneth Hansen's life was not devoid of drama. Known for his intelligence and charisma in childhood, he went on to marry his high school sweetheart, Beverly Ray Carlson, and had two sons, Danny and Mark. He opened and operated a riding stable with the name Camelot near Tinley Park in the 1960s. Roger Spry, a young worker at Hansen's riding stable, started residing at the Hansen house when he was just 11 or 12 years old, becoming a member of the family. But things took a dark turn when Hansen, after making inappropriate advances towards Spry, banished him to the kennels to sleep with the dogs. One fateful night, when Spry was still a child, Hansen initiated a relationship with him that would last for years until Spry was 18. Over the course of two decades, Spry lived on and off with Hansen. All the while, the latter picked up male hitchhikers, aged between 11 and 16 years old, and offered them lodging at the stables in exchange for work. On many occasions, Hansen bragged to Spry about having relations with these young boys. As the summer of 1994 approached, Mr. Hansen began to feel the weight of impending doom as the investigation into his possible involvement in a decades-old case closed in on him. According to the detectives, he was so paranoid that he began asking his neighbor whether there were any police officers lurking around his house. Intrigue and drama continued to unfold in the investigation surrounding the disappearance of Helen Voorhees Brock. In July 1994, police made a solid move by charging Richard Bailey, a former stable owner and acquaintance of Hansen's, with soliciting Brock's murder. But that was not all, as authorities also charged 23 other individuals for their alleged involvement in schemes to kill valuable horses in order to collect insurance payments. On August 11, 1994, the long arm of justice finally caught up with Hansen as he was arrested by the Chicago Police and Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms at his home in Country Club Hills when he was caught with a packed suitcase. The arrest was related to an arson charge for a 1972 fire that destroyed the Forest View Stables, a competing business, and claimed the lives of 36 horses. The next day, on August 12th, he was charged with three counts of murder in the peterson Schusler case. He was 22 at the time of the murders and 61 at the time of his arrest. The announcement of charges against Kenneth Hansen for three counts of murder left many wondering what evidence the authorities had against him. Refusing to disclose any hard evidence, Cook County State's attorney Jack O'Malley emphasized that after 40 years, the case could not be solved solely on physical evidence. This statement only added to the mystery surrounding the case leaving people wondering how the prosecution would build their case against Hansen. While Robert Hansen was among the 43,000 people initially questioned, there's no evidence to suggest that he knew he was a suspect or that he intentionally kept his involvement a secret from investigators. Police believe that on October 16, 1955, Robert, John, and Anton were hitchhiking on Milwaukee Avenue when they were picked up by Hansen. At the time, he lived only a few blocks away from where he found the boys. Hansen then drove them to Idle Hour Stables, a place he worked at and frequented, located on the city's northwest side. According to sources, Hansen tried to solicit inappropriate acts from the boys and became violent when they refused. The situation escalated, and Hansen ended up murdering the boys. On the same night, Hedy Salerno, a witness, was going about her business when she suddenly heard two blood-curdling screams pierce the air. The screams seemed to come from the direction of the idle hour stable. Spry, who lived with Hansen's family, testified that Hansen once told him of a horrifying incident involving three boys whom he'd picked up while they were hitchhiking. As per Hansen's account, he took them to a barn and took Anton inside the barn and assaulted him. He then took John inside when Robert and Anton came barging in with a threat. They said they'd report the incident to their parents and police if he didn't let them go. However, in the ensuing argument, the defendant grabbed one of the boys by the throat and accidentally strangled the boy and was then forced to kill the other two boys to avoid being reported. Following the killings, Hansen's friend arrived and together they disposed of the bodies in the nearby forest preserves where an employee helped them. Hansen had bragged about killing the boys to multiple people. In some of the accounts, he mentioned how his brother, Curtis Hansen, attacked one of the boys using a blunt object. 
Kenneth Hansen lived in fear as he suspected that Curtis could reveal his secrets any time. During the first trial, witnesses testified that Hansen had confessed to them about killing the boys in a tack room at the Idle Hour stable. At that time, the stable was owned by Silas Jane. He was a notorious figure in the world of horse breeding, known for his wild and reckless behavior and suspected involvement in various violent and devious dealings. Despite this, he managed to rise to power in the industry, becoming a prominent figure in the Chicago horse scene. It was suspected that Silas somehow got to know the three boys had been killed in his stable and was furious. According to some of the accounts by the witnesses, he even helped dump the bodies. Hansen boasted that after the discovery of the bodies, he shifted to South Chicago and had someone burn down the Idle Hour stable for him to avoid any evidence. In 1995, Hansen was convicted of the heinous crime, but his luck seemed to turn as the Illinois Appellate Court overturned his conviction five years later. It was found that the jury should not have been presented with evidence of Hansen's past behavior of picking up boys for inappropriate relations. However, justice eventually caught up with them at a retrial in 2002. The jury wasted no time in reaching a verdict, and Hansen was found guilty once again. The judge was not lenient in his sentencing, and Hansen was given 200 to 300 years in prison, as they made sure he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. He appealed the decision in 2004, but it was upheld. Kenneth Hansen battled dementia in the Pontiac Correctional Center and died on September 13, 2007, at the age of 74, due to natural causes. The news of his conviction stirred a mix of emotions, with some feeling a sense of relief, while others were consumed by anger. One individual deeply affected by the revelation was a stepbrother of the Schusler brothers, whose pain and resentment resurfaced upon hearing of Hansen's passing. The case was as phony as could be, declared Leonard Goodman, former attorney of Mr. Hansen, who was still convinced of his client's innocence. Goodman believed that if Hansen had been arrested soon after the murders, he could have presented a solid alibi. But with four decades gone, it was impossible to recollect the whereabouts of a specific day in October 1955. However, the prosecutors and investigators maintained that the evidence against Hansen was substantial and that the case was a deadlock. Furthermore, he claimed that Hansen had preyed on hundreds of boys in the years leading up to his arrest. The peterson Schusler murder case was more than just a crime. It was a haunting tale that gripped the entire city, spreading like a wildfire of fear and apprehension. Once a peaceful town where neighbors looked out for each other, it now became a place where people dreaded the dark and feared the unknown. While the case will never truly be closed for those who lost loved ones, the arrest and conviction of Hansen provided a sense of closure and relief for the community that had been haunted by the brutal killings for decades. Do you think Kenneth Hansen was guilty of the crime? Do you think the deaths of Robert, John, and Anton were accidental or intentional? On April 9, 2016, a bone-chilling call jolted the Renton Police Department. 911, what are you reporting? This is going to sound really bizarre, but I went to go grab my recycling bin and there were three white trash bags in the recycling bin and I went to lift them out. And honestly, it's freaking me out, but it looks like it's a foot. Wrapped in white trash bags were the gruesome remnants of a woman's body. She was 40-year-old Ingrid Line. The findings included a sliced off leg, a severed arm, and a detached head. As investigators delved deeper, their quest for the missing pieces led them to an individual looking into what happened to Ingrid as you're aware she's missing. Yes. And we know that you knew her. What's your relationship with her? What twisted secrets would they uncover in their pursuit of justice? But let's start from the beginning. Ingrid Roundsville, a vibrant and cheerful individual, was born on August 2nd, 1975 in Arizona. After graduating from Canyon del Oro High School in Tucson, Arizona in 1993, she pursued her passion for nursing and obtained a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree from the University of Arizona in 1997. Ingrid then ventured to Washington in 2000, where she spent around 13 years. 
She embarked on her nursing career at Seattle's Swedish Medical Center, making a positive impact on people's lives. Ingrid tied the knot with a man named Philip Line, and together they had three beautiful daughters, Reese, Brooke, and Noelle. However, as time went on, their relationship faced difficulties, and Ingrid made the tough decision to divorce Philip in 2014. She bravely moved out of their house and settled in Renton, Washington, along with her three daughters, ready to embark on a new chapter of her life. As a single mother, Ingrid faced challenges in providing for her three beloved daughters. She cherished them deeply and was willing to go to great lengths to ensure their happiness. In 2016, Ingrid was living in Renton with Reese, Brooke, and Noel, who were six, eight, and ten years old at the time. Despite their divorce, Ingrid and Philip maintained contact as they wanted to give their daughters the love of both parents. However, the divorce took a toll on Ingrid, leaving her feeling broken and longing for someone to share her tears with, someone who would truly love and respect her, which she'd missed in her previous marriage. It was during this difficult time that 40-year-old Ingrid met a person online through a dating site. Their conversations brought her solace, making her forget about her pain and giving her a sense of love. This person made her feel beautiful and embraced her, along with the fact that she already had three daughters. It was like a dream come true for Ingrid, marking the beginning of a new chapter in her life. On April 8, 2016, after a month of talking online, Ingrid took a leap of faith and agreed to go on a date with a man she'd met online. It was her way of embracing the possibility of moving forward in life. She left her daughters at her ex-husband's house and promised them that she'd take them out the next day. Ingrid and her date chose to attend the opening game of the Seattle Mariners, a thrilling baseball event. Following the game, they headed to a bar where the man's sister happened to work. They spent the evening joyfully playing darts, sharing drinks, and laughing together. Ingrid felt an overwhelming sense of happiness and liberation. Little did she know that this night would leave a lasting impact, not just on her own life, but also on the lives of her daughters and everyone connected to her. The next day, on April 9, 2016, Philip, Ingrid's ex-husband, arrived at her home around 10 a.m. in Renton to drop off their daughters. As he approached the house, he couldn't help but notice that Ingrid's 2015 silver Toyota Highlander was nowhere to be seen. Concerned, he knocked on the door repeatedly, but there was no response. He tried calling her multiple times, but Ingrid didn't answer any of his calls. This was strange because Ingrid was known for never breaking promises, especially when it came to her daughters. Philip couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Growing increasingly worried, Philip decided to reach out to Ingrid's mother, Jorga Bass, hoping she might have some information about Ingrid's whereabouts. However, after Jorga heard that Ingrid was not at home, she also grew worried because she was just as clueless as Philip and had no idea where Ingrid could be. Filled with anxiety, Jorga hurried to Ingrid's house as she had a spare key. She used it to enter the house and called out for Ingrid, but there was no response. Concerned, Jorga made her way upstairs to check Ingrid's bedroom, but Ingrid wasn't there. However, she did find Ingrid's purse and phone on the table, but there was no sign of Ingrid and her car. The situation seemed strange and suspicious. If Ingrid had indeed left the house, it didn't make sense for her phone and purse to be left behind. After all, most people wouldn't leave their homes without money or a way to communicate. This raised even more questions and concerns about Ingrid's whereabouts. Without wasting any time, Jorga called the police and reported her missing. Anybody reporting? The missing person out of our city, so Line is her last name. Mm -hmm. Her name Ingrid, she and her vehicle are missing. And what kind of car? A silver 2015 Toyota Highlander. And do we have any ideas of where she might be going or? No, uh, her ex-husband was dropping the kids off mm -hmm. and she wasn't there. As the police from the Renton Police Department arrived at Ingrid's house in Renton, they were greeted by Yorga, whose tear-filled eyes revealed her anguish. Initially, the police tried to calm Yorga down, suggesting that Ingrid might have gone out and would return soon. However, Yorga's intuition told her otherwise. She knew something was amiss. Determined to find her daughter, she pleaded with the police to conduct a thorough investigation. The police wasted no time and embarked on a door-to-door -door inquiry, questioning the neighbors in search of any clues. The police diligently questioned the neighbors, asking if they'd seen Ingrid entering her house last night or leaving in the morning. One neighbor had an intriguing account to share. He revealed that he'd seen Ingrid returning home with an unfamiliar man the previous night. 
the man seemed suspicious as the neighbor had never seen him before. What puzzled everyone was the fact that no one had witnessed Ingrid leave her house after that. The question lingered, who was this man? And if Ingrid came home but wasn't seen leaving, where could she be? The police urged people to reflect on any unusual occurrences they may have noticed the night before or that morning. They encouraged anyone with information to come forward, as it could be vital in finding Ingrid. The daughters grew increasingly worried when they saw the police asking about their mother. They turned to Yorga, their grandmother, seeking answers. They asked if something happened to their mother, but Yorga reassured them, saying that she'd simply gone somewhere and would return soon. The police promised Yorga that they would look into the matter. Yorga anxiously waited for her daughter to come back home, and suddenly a thought struck her mind. Yorga had a realization that she and Ingrid shared a Verizon account. A Verizon account is a personal or business account that allows you to access and manage various services provided by Verizon, such as phone plans and internet. Curious to find any clues, she checked the phone records and discovered a recurring phone number. Ingrid had received numerous calls from this number, even on the day she went missing. Yorga decided to investigate further and entered the number into Facebook. To her surprise, a profile of a man named John Charlton appeared. With hope in her heart, she reached out to him through a text message, desperately seeking any information about Ingrid's whereabouts. The reply came swiftly. My name is John. I thought she was with her kids today. Yorga quickly replied to John, her fingers trembling as she typed. When did you last see her? She was not here. Her phone, driver's license, and purse were all here, but she's gone. I've called 911 for help. John's response was filled with confusion. 911? What happened? He explained further. We went to the Mariners game last night, but we didn't spend the night together because she had to meet her kids today. I'm not sure what she told you about me and our relationship. Fear gripped Yorga as she typed back. She's missing. Can you please tell me the time you last saw her? The police needed to speak with you as you could be the last person who saw her. At that moment, it became clear to Yorga that Ingrid had indeed gone on a date with John Charlton the previous night. It seemed likely that he was the same man the neighbor had seen returning with Ingrid to her house. With a mix of worry and hope, Yorga realized that John might have some information about Ingrid's whereabouts. But John remained silent, leaving Yorga anxious and desperate for answers. She continued her texts, pleading with him. Please, John, can you call me? I know your name is John Charlton, so please reach out to me. With each passing moment, the weight of uncertainty grew heavier. Yorga couldn't bear the thought of her daughter vanishing without a trace. She pressed on, hoping for any lead, and again texted him. John, did Ingrid mention anything about meeting someone after you parted ways last night? We can't find her or her car. Her phone, ID, and purse are at home, but she and her car have disappeared. We are at our wit's end desperate for any help. Ingrid would never just abandon her family like this. However, John remained silent and didn't respond to any of the texts. Yorga felt a sense of helplessness and tears streamed down her face. The situation intensified when, six hours after Ingrid was reported missing, around 4 p.m., the police received a chilling call from a man named Mike Novasio. 911, what are you reporting? This is going to sound really bizarre, but I went to go grab my recycling bin and there were three white trash bags in the recycling bin and I went to lift them out. And honestly, it's freaking me out, but it looks like it's a foot. Mike lived approximately 10 miles away from Ingrid's house at 21st Avenue and East Rhine Street in Seattle. In a frightened voice, he relayed that while taking out his recycling bin, he discovered what appeared to be human body parts contained in white trash bags. Mike's voice trembled as he recounted his unsettling encounter. He described seeing a head and noticing the painted toenails, causing a wave of sickness to wash over him. The sight was too much to bear. He explained that the body parts had been expertly wrapped in the bags, indicating a disturbing level of precision. The police wasted no time and swiftly arrived at the scene. With careful precision, they retrieved the bags from the bins. As the bags were opened, an eerie shock fell upon them. They discovered a severed head, a portion of a leg, and an arm, while the rest of the body parts were missing. With the lack of decomposition, the facial features were intact and distinctive, which indicated that the person had been recently killed. Upon closer examination, 
the police identified the head as belonging to Ingrid, the woman who'd been reported missing earlier that day. The police were left wondering why the killer had chosen to dump the body parts only 10 miles away in a recycling bin, where they could easily be discovered. Perhaps it was a mocking gesture or a challenge to the police. Or maybe the killer wanted the body parts to be found quickly. They sent the body parts for testing to see if they could provide some clue about the killer. The task of delivering the devastating news to Ingrid's family was difficult for the police. They informed Yorga about the death of Ingrid and about her dismembered body parts that had been found. The news shattered Yorga, leaving her in a state of disbelief and questioning why anyone would inflict such cruelty on her daughter. The realization that her granddaughters would no longer experience Ingrid's love and presence was heartbreaking. Meanwhile, the police intensified their search for the missing parts. The following day, on April 10th, 2016, Yorga logged into Facebook, hoping for a response from John in light of Ingrid's tragic demise. Yet, there was still no reply. She waited till afternoon, and finally, she contacted the police and provided them with all the details about John and his connection to Ingrid. The police understood that if John was the last person who saw Ingrid, he could provide some insight into the case. They made several attempts to reach him, but received no response until the evening when John finally answered their call. Recognizing the importance of speaking with them and making sure he didn't try to run away from the interrogation, the police used a ruse, claiming they needed to discuss Ingrid's ongoing disappearance and that they were closely monitoring his activities. They warned him that if he failed to cooperate with them, then that would result in his arrest. Consequently, the next day, on April 11th, 2016, John arrived at the police department for questioning. First, the police carefully checked him to ensure that he didn't have any hidden weapons with him. Do you have anything hidden in your socks or shoes? Yeah. Then the interrogation began, and the police asked him about his place of residence. And what is an address for you, John? I'm homeless. Are you? Where are you staying right now? On the street. The police further questioned him about Ingrid. It we're looking into what happened to Ingrid as you're aware she's missing. Yes. And we know that you knew her. What's your relationship with her? Have you been dating her consistently since you met or? I would say, I guess, yeah. The police delved deeper into their relationship, seeking to understand its dynamics and uncover the potential motives that could have led John to harm her. Did she let you stay at her place or did she, were you staying elsewhere? She let me stay there sometimes. How often were you guys seeing one another, like with the last couple weeks? Surprisingly, as they observed his facial expressions, they couldn't help but notice his unusual calmness, despite the fact that his girlfriend was murdered. They questioned John about the day Ingrid was last seen, which was April 8, 2016. What's the last memory you have of contact with Ingrid? Like, what's the last memory you remember? Do you remember her driving you downtown? I believe I sent her a message that morning. I knew she had her kids the next day, so that wasn't good. She didn't want me to meet her kids, ever. I don't know about ever, but she just didn't want me to meet her kids. Their goal was to gather every possible detail about that day, wanting a comprehensive account of the events. So when you were back at her place and you had sex, and I apologize for asking this, but was it in the, was it in the, think we did. Was it in the bedroom or somewhere else? I think we did. You think you did? You don't remember it? I don't. I, we, we usually... Yeah, I'm just assuming that we did. As the questioning came to an end, the police exited the room, but the cameras continued to capture John's actions. Strangely, the cameras caught him rolling up his sweatshirt to use as a makeshift pillow, seemingly unfazed by the gravity of the situation. John's responses during the questioning were indeed peculiar. But the testing on Ingrid's body parts was still going on, and there wasn't any such evidence which could link John to Ingrid's murder. As a result, they had no choice but to release him, but they made sure to keep a close watch on his activities, hoping to uncover any new leads. In a matter of just a few days, the disappearance case had taken a grim turn, evolving into a full-fledged murder investigation. Determined to uncover the truth, the police obtained a search warrant for Ingrid's house. Inside, their search led them to a startling discovery, an almost empty box of garbage bags, similar to the ones found in the recycling bin. They combed through every nook and cranny, carefully examining the premises. To their horror, they stumbled upon a pruning saw, ominously propped up in the bathroom. Upon closer inspection, the saw's teeth revealed traces of blood, tissue, and bone. Adding to the chilling evidence, they also found blood in the bathtub drain. 
It appeared that Ingrid had been dismembered in her own bathroom with the pruning saw after her untimely demise. It became really important for them to find the remaining body parts soon. On April 15, 2016, the police received a call from a man named Michael Mullen who'd made a chilling discovery in his recycling bin. As he went through the bin that morning, he stumbled upon a wrapped package that turned out to be a torso with a pierced belly button. The police quickly responded to the call and reached 20th Avenue between East Union and Marion Streets, Seattle, and they were alarmed because Ingrid also had a pierced belly button and her previous body parts were found in similar garbage bags. They confirmed that the torso was hers. After sending the previously found body parts for testing, another significant discovery was made on April 18, 2016. A human leg was found at a recycling plant in South Hanford Street, Seattle. The leg belonged to a woman that had the same painted toenails as Ingrid. This meant that Ingrid's body parts had been scattered across three different locations, including the recycling bins where they were easily found. The police began to suspect that the perpetrator might not be a serial killer, as they typically dispose of bodies in places where they can't easily be recovered. Instead, they started considering the possibility that the culprit could be someone close to Ingrid. The police, determined to uncover any overlooked evidence, returned to Ingrid's home. They decided to remove the plumbing and conduct a thorough examination. To their surprise, they discovered more blood in the dismantled drain trap. To enhance their investigation, they utilized a regent called Blue Star, which further revealed traces of blood that had been carefully cleaned up. It became evident that this was no impulsive act of violence. It was a well-planned and executed murder, adding an intriguing twist to the case. As the reports from the testing arrived, more disturbing details about Ingrid's death came to light. Initially, her death was classified as homicidal violence, but upon closer examination by the medical examiner, they discovered petechia, tiny blood vessels in her eyes that indicated she'd been strangled. Additionally, there was evidence of hemorrhaging on the neck. It became evident that Ingrid had first been strangled and then dismembered inside her own home. It revealed the manner in which Ingrid's life was taken suggesting a deep-seated hatred towards her. The toxicology report revealed that Ingrid had no drugs in her system, but her blood alcohol level, BAC, was 0.074, slightly higher than the normal range. Two days later, on April 20th, 2016, the police discovered Ingrid's car in Belltown, a short six-minute drive from Seattle. This raised suspicion because John claimed that Ingrid had dropped him off downtown and would have returned home before her murder. It seemed odd that her car was abandoned so close to Seattle, where they'd attended the Seattle Mariners game together. The police carefully searched the entire car and made a chilling discovery. The same white trash bags that had contained Ingrid's dismembered body parts were found inside the vehicle. In addition, the police discovered three fingerprints on the driver's door handle of the car. These prints were crucial, as they could belong to Ingrid since the car belonged to her, or they could belong to the killer who'd driven her car to that location. Recognizing the importance of this evidence, the fingerprints were promptly sent for testing. The results confirm the police's suspicions. The fingerprints match those of John Charlton, the man Ingrid had gone on a date with on the night she disappeared. It became evident that John's statements during the interrogation were all deceptive tactics to misguide the police. Despite initially claiming to be drunk and unaware of what happened that night, the planning and execution of the crime along with the thorough cleaning of the house to erase any traces of evidence, indicated that John acted with full awareness and had a clear motive behind killing Ingrid. Police remembered that during the interrogation, John had said that he used to stay with his ex-girlfriend. In their quest for more information about John, the police made significant efforts to locate and interview his ex-girlfriend, ensuring her identity remained undisclosed for privacy reasons. During the interview, she revealed that John, who worked as a day laborer, would usually spend his nights at a shelter in Seattle, except for a couple of nights each week when he stayed at her place. They'd known each other for about a year, and she allowed him to keep some of his belongings at her residence. Interestingly, she mentioned to the police that John was supposed to visit her on the Saturday morning of April 9, 2016, the day after his date with Ingrid. However, he arrived later than planned, claiming that something had come up. She revealed that he arrived at the bus station in Lake Stevens around 10.30 p.m., and she immediately noticed that he had a swollen and injured lip. When questioned about it, John claimed that someone had tried to rob him at a bar, even though he still had his wallet. This detail caught the attention of the police. 
When they questioned John on April 11, 2016, they observed abrasions on his head, chin, and scratches on his chest and arms. These injuries seemed to align with the disturbing possibility. They could have been inflicted during the struggle between John and Ingrid when he strangled her. It appeared that she'd fought back bravely, leaving her mark on him in a desperate attempt to save herself. Without hesitation, the police swiftly took action, arresting John and charging him with the murder of Ingrid Lyne. John Robert Charlton was born in 1979 in Washington to his parents Ray and Joanne Charlton. At 37 years old, he had a history of run-ins with the law. His past included a misdemeanor assault conviction in King County in 1997, indicating a tendency towards aggression. In addition, he had a record of negligent driving in Washington State back in 1998. In 2006, he was charged with attempted aggravated robbery in Utah. It seemed like he was no stranger to trouble. In 2008, he was convicted of felony theft in Montana. Furthermore, records showed a misdemeanor battery case in Idaho in 2009, suggesting a pattern of violent behavior. These previous encounters with the law added a layer of complexity to John's character and raised concerns about his potential involvement in serious crimes. John's troubled past extended beyond his criminal record. Disturbing incidents involving his parents shed light on his volatile behavior. In 2006, John's parents, Ray and Joanne Charlton, sought protection against him, citing concerns for their safety. They described his drunken outbursts and expressed fear for their well-being. Court records revealed an unsettling encounter on March 2, 2006, when John, under the influence of alcohol, became physically and verbally abusive towards his parents. During that time, Ray alleged that John removed the movie Hannibal from a shelf in the house and set it in front of his wife and told her she would watch that and beware. According to his parents, John harbored grudges for years and his behavior became increasingly intimidating and violent when under the influence of alcohol or drugs. They also suspected his usage of crack cocaine. Although the petition for the protection order was ultimately dismissed, these incidents painted a troubling picture of John's unstable and aggressive tendencies. Despite initially denying any knowledge of Ingrid's fate, John eventually changed his plea to guilty before the trial commenced. The courtroom was gripped by the prosecution's case, alleging that John murdered Ingrid inside her own home. Mr. Charlton intentionally and with premeditation strangled Ingrid to death. He placed her body in a bathtub using a pruning saw. He dismembered her body, severing her limbs and head from her torso. To everyone's horror, it was then detailed how John drove through downtown Seattle, disposing of Ingrid's body parts in different trash cans. The medical examiner's report confirmed that Ingrid's death was the result of homicidal violence. In response, the defense team argued that there was a lack of forensic evidence connecting anyone, including their client, to Ingrid's murder. They pleaded with the community not to hastily jump to conclusions during this tragic event. Every piece of evidence seemed to point towards John's involvement. The prosecutor, Dan Satterberg, acknowledged that there were still unanswered questions. The motive behind Ingrid's murder may never be fully understood. However, he commended the diligent work of the police and prosecutors who painstakingly gathered evidence to build a strong case against the person they believed was responsible for her death. It was a challenging task, but their dedication paid off in bringing justice to Ingrid. John received a maximum prison sentence of 27 years and 9 months based on the state's guidelines. However, Judge Julie Spector, presiding over the case in King County Superior Court, expressed her strong condemnation, stating that if she had the power, she would have given him a life sentence. She described his actions as vicious and cruel, beyond anyone's imagination. During the sentencing hearing, John addressed the court and Ingrid's grieving family, acknowledging the immense pain he caused and expressing genuine remorse. I do agree that there are no words that can... There's no words that can alleviate the pain that I've caused. And for that, I'm truly sorry. Ingrid's ex-husband, Philip Line, expressed the profound loss caused by John's actions, describing how John had stolen not only his co-parent and someone to share thoughts with, but also a loving and caring mother to their daughters. 
Philip lamented that they would no longer have Ingrid's motherly advice, miss out on cherished traditions like July 4th holidays in Big Fork, Montana, beach trips and Thursday night dinners at a steakhouse. He further shared the heartbreaking reality that their children's future children would never know the love of a maternal grandmother. Despite their resilience, Philip acknowledged that their daughters deeply feel the absence of their mother every single day. Our daughters continue to thrive, but miss their mother every day in different ways. Ingrid's friend, Nancy Civitilli, expressed the indescribable horror that engulfed everyone upon learning about Ingrid's tragic death. She emphasized that the murder went beyond a simple act of violence. Her body was violated, leaving an unimaginable aftermath. Civitilli didn't mince words in calling John a coward. Civitilli directed her words directly at John, reminding him of the profound impact his actions had on Ingrid's daughters. As he selfishly tore away a beautiful person, and a devoted mother from their lives. She further highlighted the loss felt by friends like herself who cherished Ingrid like a sister. While justice has been served, the scars of this tragedy remain. Let this case serve as a reminder of the importance of vigilance, empathy, and the pursuit of justice for those whose lives have been stolen. What are your thoughts on this case? What could be the reason for John to kill Ingrid in such a horrific manner? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.